Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown compilation of every episode of Ms. Marvel on Disney+, Plus, along with my exclusive postseason interview with Kamala Khan herself, Iman Vellani. With the Marvels coming to theaters, we wanted to put all of our analyses of the Ms. Marvel series from summer 2022 into one massive compilation video for anyone who didn't see the series or anyone who wants a recap. So what you're about to see is my episode by episode Easter egg breakdowns that are already elsewhere on the channel. We just wanted to compile them this way for those who have been asking for a longer recap podcast style video on who Kamala Khan is, what she's gone through, and why the MCU is so intent on linking her with mutant kind. I'm actually gonna leave in my week to week speculation just so you can relive how fun it was to experience that series even when the theories were debunked the following week. You're getting sweaty summer 2022, Eric Voss, warts and all. But I think all of these breakdowns are fascinating to rewatch, especially my interview with Iman, which we are including at the end of this video because a lot of what she said comes under new light now that the Marvels is here, specifically what she says about Kang and what she says about the MCU mutant plan. If you want to support us, New Rockstars has a Marvel-themed Flurkin shirt available at nerdriot.shop. And without further ado, let's rewind the clock 18 months and enjoy these breakdowns of Miss Marvel. This is a breakdown of Miss Marvel episode one, which makes us wonder why are the only superpowers I leave fan conventions with sunburn and COVID? Let's break down this first episode shot by shot for the many MCU Easter eggs and details that you might have missed. And I was fortunate this time to talk to the directors of this episode, Adil and Bilal, who gave me some exclusive insights that I will be including in this breakdown. The Marvel Studios title card has now been updated with a shot of Doctor Strange from Multiverse of Madness. And then on the M, it's our man Moon Knight. Over this, we hear the weekend's blinding lights, a tease for the aesthetics of this series. Many shots have blinding lens flares of the same kind of purple fuchsia color of Miss Marvel's hard light in the weird realm that she goes to. And it is literally blinding light that activates Kamala's powers at the convention. All of this reflecting how Kamala metaphorically finds herself blinded by the light of her own new cosmic powers, both how cool they are and the burden of being a superhero. This opening sequence is, I love it, a YouTube video as Kamala uses her drawings to recap the events of Avengers Endgame. Now, Kamala Khan first appeared as a fan of Captain Marvel Carol Danvers in a 2013 Captain Marvel comic and then shortly after got her own spinoff in 2014 from writer G. Willow Wilson that explored her point of view as a Pakistani-American Muslim teenager in Jersey City and really a total Marvel stan. That whole one step removed fandom is at the heart of this character and why so many Many comics readers, as Marvel fans ourselves, could connect with her. And it's just so great that this series opens with a Marvel fan video. I feel seen. Iman Vellani herself is an MCU nerd who carries around with her a notebook filled with MCU notes and questions, who I found out in the press conference is a big fan of this channel, might be watching right now, I hope so. All this to say, this opening feels super authentic. We start with Kamala's drawings, including Grouchy Hulk, and then hands together with Bismala, an expression meaning in the name of God, an expression that characters say throughout this episode. We see her flying sloth and then Bigfoot with his nether regions and upper regions covered by stars. Kamala says this is a 10 part series on Earth's mightiest hero using the Avengers moniker, but describing Captain Marvel's savior role in Endgame. We see drawings of Cap, Iron Man, Hulk, Black Panther, Thick, Thor, and Okoye slaying Thanos' forces in the final charge of Endgame. Hawkeye is using a rubber band bow flinging thumbtacks. There's a post-it note listing Captain Marvel's sightings, sandy beaches, Tokyo, Dark Alley, in an arena. Kamala says the Avengers were losing at this point in the battle, and she's not wrong. It was really an all-his-last moment when Captain Marvel showed up. I like how we see the main Avengers joined by Wanda Maximoff, Ant-Man, Valkyrie, and Pepper Potts' rescue, and we see Cap's shield broken. Kamala says Thanos was being a jerk about magical stones, of course, referring to the Infinity Stones, and we see his warship with Boo, you suck on a note in the corner. We hear an eagle screech over a bird with a Carol Danvers mohawk. Right below that is a drawing of Proxima Midnight, and then we see Carol's fighter jet and Carol flying past a sign that reads the future is female. Then some comics art of Captain Marvel flying through space and Kamala drags an MS Paint file of Captain Marvel across her desktop screen. What generation of computer is she using? And I love it. Kamala mentioned studying Scott Lang's podcast. It's called Big Me Little Me on This Powered Life, which must be a parody of This American Life that does interviews with superheroes in the MCU. Suggesting that this superhero confessional podcast was how the public of the MCU learned of everything the Avengers did during the Infinity War and Endgame events. And this might have been what informed Paul Greengrass's film, The Snap, that we saw on the in-flight movie screen in Spider-Man Far From Home. Just a cool little detail that actually tells us a lot about the MCU. Now, when I asked the directors, Dylan Balala, about other Avengers having podcasts in the MCU, here's what they had to say. Uh, do you think any other Avengers might have a podcast series other than Scott Lang? 
Why well, it would be it would be great to uh, I mean I would love to know what the Hulk uh, you know what his podcast is you know that or Deadpool I mean I think, Deadpool would be funny I, I think imagine yeah. you have Deadpool yeah. and Blade doing a doing a podcast <laughs> that, that would be pretty cool you heard it here folks MCU canon Blade and Deadpool have a podcast together I think we should call it Steak Chimichanga the Steak spelled S T A K E Kamala recaps how in Endgame Carol flew directly through Thanos's fleet also how she changed her hair for this return and she did take on Thanos one by one. Kamala does leave out though how Carol Danvers got walloped pretty hard with the Power Stone. I like how Cap and Scott Lang are seen with actual band-aids on them and you can see how their torn limbs are taped back together with scotch tape. Kamala addresses how Carol the Cosmic Avenger is not on Earth currently, recalling Rhodey calling Carol out in Endgame and setting up whatever the plot will be for when Kamala Khan joins Monica Rambeau and Carol Danvers in the film The Marvels. Here we see photos of Kamala's friends Bruno and Nakia and her brother Amir and in this animation when Carol returns that the Avenger Con beside a cap shield is a war machine head winking over at a Carol head smooching, which is a nod to the romance between these two characters in the comics. And maybe in the MCU, I mean, they had that moment where they looked at each other in Endgame. Kamala says she has a two part series on why Thor is secretly a gamer, a reference, of course, to Thor playing Fortnite in Endgame. And she says new episodes drop every Wednesday, a nod to how this series drops on Wednesdays. Her YouTube channel is Sloth Baby Productions. Two subscribers. Oh, you'll get there. Must be brutal and Akia since they both leave comments on this video. Now, the Miss Marvel press conference included me asking Iman Vellani directly if Kamala Khan subscribed to New Rockstars, and she said that she wasn't sure, but probably at least a variant of us. So sweet of her to be so kind to us. We love you, Iman. Especially since you know the artists of the show here were citing New Rockstars with these thumbnails and video titles. Truth revealed on the real Carol Danvers story, Ant-Man and the Wasp's romantic vacation in Paris. I like how that flying ant has a beret. And then, where did she get her powers? bitten by a radioactive feminist. On this day, Kamala wears a shirt reading, ladies, let's get information. We have Captain Marvel, Valkyrie, and Wasp parodying the Beyonce song. And we meet her family, her brother Amir, her father Yusuf, and her mother Muniba. Of the three, I like how Yusuf is the rule breaker. He tells Amir to pray less. He tells Kamala to skip stop signs and fake looking in the mirror. But the first thing Kamala does on her driving test after buckling in, mirror check with the aviators. It is clear that she is thinking to herself, hire for the faster baby, which may be also why she she floors the gas. The driving instructor is played by Randy Havens, AKA Mr. Clark from Stranger Things. The directors of the series say that they were inspired by Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And like that movie does, the opening titles here flash through more of Kamala Khan's art showing a comic cover drawn by her Jersey City Comics approved by the KK code, Kamala Khan code. I get a little nervous when I see multiple Ks back to back, but we'll look past that. In this comic issue, she battles the something king. And on the page behind this are more drawings showing Scott Lang and Kamala's mutated human man ant. As Kamala's parents drive her home, Munita says, This is my fault. This is all my fault. These are my genetics. I mean, I come from a long line of fantasizing on realistic daydreamers. My mother was one. Yeah, little clue here pointing to Kamala and her mother's family history, specifically Muniba's mother, as the source of the powers that Kamala gains. Kamala attends Cole's Academic High School, where the founders are all comics writers and artists most crucial to the creation of the Kamala Khan character. Of course, G. Willow Wilson, the Miss Marvel Comics writer I mentioned before, Steven Wacker, Marvel animated producer behind many of Kamala's comic team ups, Adrian Alfona, an artist on the first Kamala run, Jamie McKelvey, an artist who helped relaunch Carol Danvers and design Kamala Khan's first Miss Marvel outfit, Ian Herring, known for titles like Miss Marvel and Silk, especially, Takeshi Miyazawa, another artist who worked on the Kamala run, Joe Karamanga, a Marvel Comics writer on several titles over the years, and Nico Leon, another artist who worked on the Kamala comics. I love that they get a shout out here. I just, you know, hope that Disney pays them all a little bonus too. We meet Kamala's friends, Bruno Corelli and Nakia Bahadir, and the popular girl of the school, Zoe Zimmer, all of these from this particular run of the comics. Around the school are signs reading, Dustin for Prez, he is a very good choice. Dustin Barry was the guy who worked in the set department for the show and a number of MCU titles. Kamala meets with guidance counselor Gabe Wilson, I assume named after G. Willow Wilson, GWW is written on his desk organizer. A quick montage of Kamala's mishaps all show flashes of light, the dodgeball hit, the chemistry explosion, the sunlight beaming in on the art teacher. Kamala is blinded by the light at the beginning, setting her up to eventually control and master the light. Mr. Wilson motivates Kamala with the lyrics of reflection from Mulan. I'm not gonna lie, high school staff could do worse than just recite Disney lyrics to kids. He says, I know fantasy's fun. Fantasy's really fun. But right now, I need you to pull yourself together 
and join reality. I like how the split screen reflects how divided Kamala is right now, staying grounded in reality or escaping into her dreams and fantasies. Her path forward is in the latter. The Circle Q shop shows up, Kamala's home base in this run of the comics. She and Bruno plan to go to Avengers Con, which is a lot like the 8 day celebration in the Avengers game, which leads to Kamala Khan getting her powers in San Francisco. The graffiti they bike past all comes to light. It looks amazing, visualizing their final flourish pitches. We see steampunk Captain Marvel, mashups Captain Panther or Iron Marvel. They end up in a cat fight. Then Doctor Strange Marvel, who comes in from a portal and makes that same fanned out arm pose as the images of Icon spell that we saw in Infinity War and the Souls of the Damned in Multiverse of Madness. Then Captain Marvel on a Pegasus, like Valkyrie rode in Endgame and Jane rides in Thor 4. Then Princess Captain Marvel, who changes the graffiti word to shine. Then zombie Captain Marvel, her thumb falls off. I love that. And when they are all rejected, they all look really sad. Like you can see steampunk ghost taking her hat off. Interesting how Kamala watches an episode of Felicity. Like where is that playing on TV and syndication anymore? But then Kamala's upside down world turns right side up on this delivery from her nani, showing how what's inside that box is really the answer that will straighten out her life, the bangle. An artifact that Maniba has definitely seen before and immediately tells Amir to hide in the attic. When you think about it, this whole afternoon with Kamala and her mom must have been unplanned. Like originally Maniba was gonna go wedding shopping with Amir, but she took Kamala to take Kamala's mind off of the bangle and off of her grandmother. Now there are a lot of ways we could read this bangle, exactly what it is for now. Could be an analog of the Kree Nega Band that transports Marvel to the negative zone, or maybe the quantum bands worn by Quasar to fire energy blasts. I actually think this is some extraterrestrial tech. There is some indecipherable writing and a symbol that looks like a starburst, but really more importantly for Kamala, I think it's something connected to her family history. They get home and greet Bruno. I'll pack you something to go. No, no, I'm good. Hey, how was it? Psst. Don't mention Belgium or any guy named Rob. Did you ask her about Avenger God? Is Bruno? There's a spicy yeah. one at the bottom for no now, Oh okay? my gosh, how did you do that so fast? <laughs> Whoa, so I timed it out. Muniba put that to-go bag together in 10 seconds. If it's meant to be just a super mom gag, we don't really see Muniba do this anywhere else. I'm just saying, it could just be a joke for the mom or the women of this family might have something going on with them. Her parents refuse to let her attend AvengerCon and Amir checks in on her asking if she's still afraid of the Jinn. Jinns are spirits and demons in Arabic mythology, the term and concept later anglicized as genie. She claims to no longer be afraid of the dark, but she does use a starlight projector thing in her bedroom. Don't worry, Kamala. Having a healthy fear of demons is just part of being a true Marvel fan. The poster behind her bed shows Captain Marvel from Jerry Dotson's cover of the comic Captain Marvel number five. It really just seems like they pulled every awesome looking comics image of Captain Marvel and put it on her bedroom walls. I like how Kamala's text appears in the star lights of her ceiling, whereas Bruno's response takes the form of the street paint as the taxi drives over it. But in addition to the VFX animation, I like how they did this practically by igniting the neon signs in the store windows and then the LED marquee showing their ellipses and their emojis. Kamala's parents try to compromise that Kamala can go to Avengers Con with her dad with her as Little Hulk, him as Big Hulk, which I would love to have my parents offer to do this with me. I don't think I'd find it embarrassing, but I get it. Kamala says it'd be humiliating. And there's a huge missed opportunity here to have Yusuf sadly walk out to the 80s Hulk theme. Like, yeah, wouldn't that have been awesome? I mean, they did use this track in the 2008 Hulk film. Bruno references a time when Kamala fell into the Hudson River, which is something that happens to Zoe Zimmer in the comics that leads to Kamala's first superpowered rescue. Kamala and Bruno sit on the roof, their feet dangling by an Iron Man sign, but it looks a bit blurred. And that might've been because the show's producers were told to tone down the numerous Iron Man references they were gonna make. But actually, if you look really closely, you can barely make out that this is really an Iron Man themed serial called Iron Bran. Behind them is a sign for Edison Electric with these bolt images, which might be teasing Kamala's eventual logo of a lightning bolt. He gives her these gloves for her cosplay. Are those photon gloves? Yeah. Yes, photon is capitalized in the closed captioning, meaning that they're referring to Monica Rambeau, photon, from her mother Maria's call sign. She goes by both photon and spectrum in the comics, but WandaVision never actually named her. So she's now confirmed as photon, and apparently enough of a public figure for Kamala and Bruno to know about her and her powers, which is interesting. Now, the directors had this to say about the photon Easter egg. How do they know who Monica Rambeau is? I want to ask you guys' thoughts on that. 
Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we would ask a question like that to Kevin Feige, he would say, I don't answer that. I would say that. <laughs> we will see and discover like anybody else because we would all say, hey, so what happens in the Marvels, actually? What do yeah, we yeah. Uh, uh, Kevin, Kevin Feige it. and, and uh, or, or, you know, Doctor Strange or in, in Spider-Man, and he would always say, no, if there's a problem, I'll tell you. And I don't tell you why. <laughs> so, so, Just stay in the Mar stay Marvel late. world. Stay late. <laughs> so to me, that sounds like it might have been a deliberate inclusion by the studio to set up up Kamala's coming crossover with Monica and Carol. Kamala breaks down her elaborate plan to Bruno to get to Avengers Con. In her fantasy, her cosplay is actual MCU wardrobe standard, and she does a Black Widow landing out her window. The pose, something that the show's producer said Kamala would know as one of the few female superheroes she grew up seeing footage of. Bruno in this fantasy cosplay is Tony Stark wearing sunglasses, a goatee, and a blowing chest reactor. Avenger Con is at Camp Lehigh. That's the New Jersey base where Steve Rogers trained, where Steve and Black Widow returned to in Winter Soldier, and Cap and Tony visited in 1970 in Endgame. On the bus in this fantasy are cosplayers of the Star Spangled Dancers and Loki and a sorcerer with a shield. Among all the fantasy selfies are a pipe, a cylindrical rocket raccoon, a Nick Fury, Vision eating a pretzel, and it ends with Kamala dreaming of getting a tiara, something that she rejected earlier when Bruno pitched Princess Captain Marvel. And then the set transitions practically into an upright bed, which is the same camera trick of the Nexus antidepressant commercial in WandaVision. And while Kamala's plan ultimately goes awry, she does in the night dropping into bed. Yes, this dream plan immediately falls apart. Instead of a superhero landing out her window, she breaks the tree branch and falls hard. That was the way she was going to get back into her room. Really, the only way she's able to get back into her window is with the help of that hard light that she's later able to summon. Poor Bruno, even his outfit doesn't look as cool. We learn later his whole cosplay is just a white lab coat for Bruce Banner. This poor guy spent way more time making Kamala's cosplay suit than he did his own. We all need friends like Bruno, but instead, we don't talk about Bruno. The Camp Lehigh banner is actually similar to the sign at the gate when Tony and Cap arrived in 1970 in Endgame. They added Cap's shield in the middle of it, and I like how they put this large statue of Captain America in a Jeep. If you listen to the music playing in the scene, it is the Star Spangled Man with the plan. I like the little dance that the guy in the Wakandan garb does to celebrate his awesome looking fit. Inside, the convention booths include things Hulk smashed, which I guess is just a collection of rubble and broken stuff from all of Hulk's collateral damage over the years. You can see a fridge with a giant handprint in it. There's a giant man, Scott Lang, display with a fairy in a pool, recreating his size up in the San Francisco Bay in Ant-Man and the Wasp. There's a cosmic Avenger Captain Marvel setup. There's a realm of Asgard with a Thor throne that you can sit on. We see the Iron Man dancers from the Stark Expo in Iron Man 2, mugs of Mjolnir ale, some art pieces referencing America's ass. I understood that reference. Then there's a memorial wall for the fallen with messages to various loved ones pinned up to it. In the middle is Natasha and Tony on display, but no vision. Also in the upper right of all the notes is a mention of the Sokovia Accords. I assume someone's saying, this is why we need the Sokovia Accords. Hey, hey, why you gotta make this so political, bro? There's another booth with a guy dressed as Drax showing a DVD on sale, the Peter Quill Star Boy Story, Pal to All Planets, a 40 minute documentary series. I like how the title calls him Star Boy, keeping up with a recurring gag of messing up his name. It isn't Star Prince. Star Lord. Oh, sorry. Presumably if Quill himself would have been the source for this, they probably would have gotten his name right. So I'm guessing this is a third party trying to cash in on it. Also in the background is a shelf with rocket plushies labeled trash pandas, because that's what he is. He is a trash panda. Is that better? I don't know. It's so much worse. Another guy hands out pamphlets for Avenger tours to New Asgard, which might be part of the tourist attractions that we are now seeing in Thor Love and Thunder footage. Now, here's a fun one. After Kamala leaves the bathroom, there is a cardboard Captain America and a cardboard Iron Man on the left of the frame, which were actually cameos by Sagar Sheikh and Rish Shah, who play Amir and Cameron, thanks to Sagar, friend of the show, who actually sent me a photo of him and Rish on set. Kamala is able to unlock the bangle by twisting a small circle that turns four other cogs, and then it clips on and extends, then coats her body with a layer of cosmic radiation, and then she falls backward into this interesting purple-tinted realm filled with shadowy figures, their eyes glowing. Many of them look bald and caped carrying spears. I don't know, they look a bit like Watchers, a statue of whom appears in Thor 4. Now, if this bangle is based on the Kree Negabands, we might be looking at the negative zone, but I think this is gonna be more personal to Kamala and her family, her Nani. The purple and fuchsia tones actually remind me a lot of the Ancestral Plane, which Moon Knight just told us is part of the same MCU afterlife 
life network as the Egyptian underworld. We could be looking at another spiritual realm that's connected with the ancestors of the Khan women, ancestors who might be extraterrestrial, Kree, or Skrull, or Kree experiments on the humans, the Inhumans. Because in the comics, Kamala gets her powers by being enveloped in Terrigen Mist, a process called Terrigenesis that creates Inhumans. And in her Terrigen cocoon, she sees the forms of Cap and Iron Man and Captain Marvel and comes out in a form modeled on her idol Carol Danvers, but with stretchy limbs before she realizes that she could just look like herself. In Marvel lore, the Inhumans are genetic experiments by the Kree, and in the MCU, the Kree Supreme Intelligence uses tech in which its form manifests based on the perceiver's inner desires. So Kamala's cosmic powers from this bangle may still be Kree or Inhuman in origin, but coming to Kamala by way of her Pakistani grandmother, who maybe could have been an extraterrestrial refugee on Earth with alien technology to harness the power of the cosmos to manifest one's inner desires. In fact, this layer of cosmic radiation wisping around her body could be the MCU's version of Terrigen Mist. I'm just doing my best to theorize how this works. We'll learn more in future episodes. Now, as she takes the stage, light is what triggers her powers to activate the flashing camera. And as she is blinded by the light, she emits a series of crystalline disks what the show calls hard light, the same colors of the realm she fell into. Now, yes, this is the change from Kamala's powers in the comics in which she can stretch and embiggen her limbs like Reed Richards can, but the producers have said that they want to better align MCU Kamala with where the MCU currently is. And that seems to be either cosmic radiation of Captain Marvel and Photon and the Kree, or maybe a kind of mystical light inherited from her grandmother. Or really, again, as I think, a mix of the two. One blast of these knocks the giant man helmet loose so that this thing boulders through the convention, rude Goldberging the Avengers boost so that a giant Mjolnir swings right into Zoe. Think about it, for Kamala, this is her worst nightmare, something that she did, causing the collapse of every Avenger before her eyes. In the comics, Kamala's first hero moment is saving Zoe and beginning her hand to lift her from the Hudson River. Here, she uses a cosmic extension of her hand and arm to cushion Zoe. Zoe's fall. Actually, in the closing credits of this episode, you can see an embiggened version of Kamala's hand catching Zoe, as it looks in the comics. The animation on the house as Kamala gets home shows the time as 11-11, which is the time one makes a wish. A nod to Kamala going through a bit of wish fulfillment here. Her mother catches her sneaking back in. Do you want to be good? Like we raised you to be? Or, or do you want to be some, you know, this cosmic head in the clouds person? And dropping back down on her bed, Kamala answers. Cosmic. Yes, this decision comes with Kamala falling backward, just as she did when she first snapped on that bangle and fell into her, what I think, ancestral netherworld. And when you think back to the earlier scene, this reaffirms her accidental reverse on the driving test as exactly the right direction for her, moving backward, but really just to give herself a runway to launch into the cosmos. The closing credits have a few more fun Easter eggs, Kamala's iconic red converses and her scarf from the comics. We see a trust a bro moving truck from Hawkeye, and we see the same Kamala Khan yellow bolt on purple t-shirt design from the comics. Now there's a quick shot of a skyscraper with the vestiges of the Avengers Tower Quinjet landing pad, but it's a new facade. This is no longer Avengers Tower. I would say this could be the Baxter building, but Multiverse of Madness showed the Baxter Foundation in Central Park. Then again, that was 838, this is 616. Even though Iman Vellani vocally disagrees with Kevin Feige on the MCU's numerical designation. I'm sorry, we love you, Iman, but I, I gotta go with Papa Feige on this one. Then on to a post credit scene featuring the turn of Ariane Moyad as DODC agent Cleary from Spider-Man No Way Home. Last scene interrogating Peter Parker, MJ, Ned, and Aunt May before Matt Murdock was able to get the DODC to drop the charges. Cleary and Agent Deaver now see footage of Kamala and decide to bring her in, meaning this series is gonna shed some more light on what the DODC is up to, their connections to Nick Fury and S.W.O.R.D., and hopefully confirm my Skrull suspicions that Agent Cleary might be a Skrull connected with Marvel's secret invasion plans. His concerned look suggests he has seen this kind of technology before, and if Cleary is a Skrull, he might be seeing some Kree weapons tech emerging in one of the Kree sleeper cells Nick Fury, aka the Skrull Talos, mentioned in Spider-Man Far From Home. Remember, Kree and Skrulls are forever at war, something we'll probably learn more about in Secret Invasion. And the next title Kamala Khan is going to appear in, The Marvels. So maybe now this look is telling us that Cleary is seeing some evidence of a Kree sleeper cell with the Kree genetic experiments called Inhumans, which might be what Kamala Khan's Pakistani ancestors were. We will see. And I'm not sure how much to read into this, but under Steever's phone on her desk 
are wanted flyers for a Caucasian woman, 5'8", brown hair, 180 pounds, wanted in connection to a double homicide on July 12, 1979 in the municipal graveyard. 1979 is ages ago in MCU history, and my only guess, based on a graveyard slaying, is that this might tie into Blade somehow? There are some photos on their board showing some folks from older eras. Maybe vampires are on their docket too. This is a breakdown of Miss Marvel Episode 2, which teaches us all a little something about pretending your crush is your cousin when we're in the wish fulfillment genre, it may just come true. I mean, hey, we, we don't know that for sure yet, which is exactly what we say at family reunions down in the South. Let us break down this episode shot by shot for all the MCU Easter eggs and details you missed. Notice how the S in the previously on screen matches the S of the Ms. Marvel title in the comics and in the series. They intentionally stylized that S to draw the eye to it and make it clear that she isn't a Miss Marvel, like little Miss superhero, but rather Ms. An independent woman in control of her own life. The episode opens on Kamala strutting back into her school to Mace's feel so good, the chorus to which is bad, 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 bad boy. Make me feel so good. A little tease of the bad, bad boy Kamran, whom Kamala will fall for this episode, bad, bad boy with ulterior motives. She wears a Save Ferris button, Save Ferris being a ska punk band, who of course got its name from the gag in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where Ferris faked being deathly ill to get out of school, launching the Save Ferris campaign, while he rigged up a stereo in his bedroom to fool his parents, similar to how Kamala tried to use Zuzu to trick her parents into thinking she was in her room. She fools around with a basketball, echoing Andrew Garfield Peter Parker's post-power-up moves in The Amazing Spider-Man, but then she bumps into Kamran, knocking over her chemistry textbook, as we saw with Peter and MJ smooching beside their chemistry textbook. It's a little on the nose. Kamran wears the color blue, and with Kamala's purple color tones, there definitely is some conscious wardrobing here. As in the Miss Marvel comics, Kamran gets hit with the same Terrigen mist that Kamala does, transforming him into an inhuman with blue colored bioluminescence, where he can release energy blasts or transfer his energy into an object, causing it to glow and to explode. This episode's ending reveals Kamran was targeting Kamala from the very beginning in league with his mother, Najma. And I would not be surprised if he actually bumped into to her on purpose here, either to plant a tracker on her, maybe lift something off her, or maybe just test her power reflexes. Kamala tells Bruno, I tried to shrink and, and, and fly and talk to ants and none of it worked. Wait, what, what makes you think you have ant powers? Because we're both charming and we look a lot younger than we are. A nod to actor Paul Rudd's freakish agelessness and the fact that in the MCU, Scott Lang bypassed the blip while he was in the quantum realm, making him older on paper than he is biologically. And at one point in game, he did have the body of a baby. And the fact that all of these MCU actors Actors playing teenagers are several years older in real life than their characters are. They pass this poster with a QR code, which is also something we saw in many episodes of Moon Knight. Intentional Easter eggs snuck in there by the Marvel Studios team, because when you scan this with your phone, it actually takes you to an issue from the 2014 Miss Marvel run. Actually, this same QR code showed up in episode one on the ATM in Bruno's Circle Q store, and last week that code took you to Miss Marvel number one from 2014. This week, the QR code takes you to number 15 of the 2014 Miss. Marvel run, the issue when Kamala meets Kamran. Social media star Zoe Zimmer quadrupled her followers posting about her rescue by Kamala on TikTok, and she brags about it here in the cafeteria. And then this like beautiful white light like cascaded over me. I felt this wave of calmness like I knew I was safe. Okay, I don't want to read in this too much. And uh, you know, we're all probably going to come around on Zoe. She's actually much nicer than she seems right now. But the one thing we know about that hard light that saved her was that it was not the color white. It had other colors in it. I'm sorry, Zoe. I know you didn't mean to say it. But Zoe does bullshit the name Nightlight, similar to in Far From Home when Ned had to come up with a superhero name and came up with Night Monkey. The opening titles of this episode toggle through a bunch of interesting designs. First, Miss Marvel as Brass Knuckles. The period on the Miz is the same shape as the Starburst icon on her bangle, then her card dashboard, then a Donkey Kong style game, and a night sky with a crescent moon evoking the Moon Knight title imagery, and then one in the style of Saved by the Bell. Kamala makes a fist. How does it feel? Like an idea come to life. Yeah, another clue that Kamala's powers are a form of wish fulfillment triggered by her inner desires and thoughts. Also, if this is innate to Kamala Khan's DNA, that makes it even more likely she could be an inhuman as she is in the comics, but rather than exposed to Terrigen Mist herself, she just may be the daughter, granddaughter, and great granddaughter of inhumans and activated by a piece of Kree tech. That could be what triggered the Terrigenesis process. The mural by the playground that they train at was actual art created by New Orleans area artist and activist B Mike. Brandon Oda 
items. And then Kamala gets the idea from watching Bruno play, looks like the game Lucky's Tale, to use her hard light as a lily pad. Bruno's tablet impressively tracks Kamala's vitals and is able to deduce from that that the power comes from within her, not from the bangle. Meaning that the bangle really just unlocked the power that was already in her DNA from her family ancestry. And like we are wondering what that is, Kamala begins to speculate. So what am I like, as guardian or something? Dude, am I related to Thor? Oh, no, I didn't say any of that. Maybe. While Kamala is probably not an Asgardian like Thor is, she may be something else extraterrestrial in origin, like an inhuman experiment by the alien race of the Kree. She and Bruno notice some writing on her bangle, Kamala thinking it's either Arabic or maybe Urdu, but from our vantage point, it's not clear if they're talking about the symbols on the green bands or somewhere else on this bangle. But for reference, we do know the alphabets for the Kree and the scroll languages, and we've also seen the written language of Zandarian in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. So Kamala experiments with this lily padding on this hard light. She hangs on the ledge by that iron brand poster that we saw last episode. This fake out with her and Bruno acting like she was gonna fall off the building just for her to drop a few feet definitely reads like a restaging of Natasha's death in Endgame, with Bruno playing the platonic ideal best friend Clint. I assume an account of this would have been in an episode of Scott Lang's podcast for Natasha to now be on a memorial poster in Avengers Con. I would hope that Kamala would take a moment of silence. And she eventually gets the hang of it. The shot framing her within the bolt of the neon Edison sign, just a cool way of showing that she is now in control of the hard light. If you think about it, that is kind of what a neon sign is. It's light, but, it, but, but, but it's hard. It's hard. Now, of course, in order to uh, accomplish the stunt of this shot, they had someone on a green screen set and then VFX them onto this roof, which is why that little celebratory yes at the end just looks a little weird. Oh, and this Edison sign, by the way, is a reference to the inventor that was Kamala Khan's first real villain in the 2014 comics, a cockatiel bird possessed with the consciousness of a clone of Thomas Edison. Actually, that cockatiel bird we saw among Kamala Khan's drawings in the opening imagery of episode one was also a nod to that guy. It's a little too wacky of a concept probably for this show, but I'm so glad that they pay homage to him this way. Kamala and Nakia are late to mosque services, and we learn how the women's section of this mosque is less maintained. We get some crumbling tiles in the bathroom, mold under the carpet, less security around the women's shoe racks. Because poor Nakia gets her shoes stolen. Maybe whoever that Skrull was who stole Nick Fury's shoes on the Skrull space station. You got my shoes! Skrulls might have a thing about stealing shoes. And we laugh about that, but I, I do think Skrulls are gonna show up in the show. At least I hope they will. And my favorite detail this episode, later when Kamala saves that kid from falling, we get a close-up of the shoes. And what do you know, it was this twerp who stole Nakia's shoes. The women of this mosque have to deal with enough, kid. Onto Zoe's party, which becomes a pool party because Cameron does a high jump into the pool. Super weird to do, even though this pool is heated because it is freaking cold outside. They're all wearing coats, they have these heater lamps, and now poor Cameron's gonna be stuck in wet clothes all night. As he leaves this pool, you can see some blue light and blue mist steaming around him, definitely evoking that bioluminescent form from the comics. Actually, later during Kamala's fantasy sequence, she envisions herself in purple neon and Kamran in blue neon, maybe a nod to them both being bioluminescent in human. I like how poor jealous Bruno tries to subvert Cameron's coolness. You really belly flopped back there, man. That that had to hurt. I don't think so. I don't really feel a thing. Nice try, Bruno. Ain't gonna happen. Why? Because Cameron clearly has some oddly inhuman properties to his body. And Kamala flirt by discussing their favorite Bollywood films, referencing SRK. That, of course, is the great Shah Rukh Khan, massive Bollywood movie star. And they also mentioned two of his biggest titles, Bazigar from 1993 and DDLJ from 1995. He gives her his number, but again, as sweet as this seems, it is too good to be true. Kamran has ulterior motives and was clearly assigned by his mother to get close to Kamala. Kamala. Bruno was right to be suspicious. If things are too good to be true, they often are. But poor Kamala doesn't know that yet because she is smitten. The lens dissolves into the lights all forming these heart shapes. And then we get this adorable dance number to the Ronettes, Be My Baby. And again, because it's my job to ruin wholesome things, Be My Baby, sung by Ronnie Spector, produced by Phil Spector. Phil Spector was married to her and did horrible, horrible things to her. Look it up. So as sweet as things seem on the surface, there is actually a dark truth behind them. Now, last episode, we saw a similar fantasy sequence from Kamala's perspective of her whole family all dancing in celebration of Kamala. But now, notice it is only Kamala dancing as her parents watch on from the kitchen confused. Kamala is joined only by the beautiful, vibrant lights now filling the house. Because Kamala's core relationship in the series is really a dance between her and her lights. This fantasy turns to neon forms of her and Kamran drifting off into space, joined by two astronaut sloth babies. This transitions to Kamala daydreaming at her desk, and her nose suddenly glows. An analogous scenario to getting that 
that surprise zit on your nose in the middle of a school day, naturally leading to Nakia, what a great friend, handing her a tampon. And by the way, I hope this was not the reason why this show was randomly rated TV 14, because you really think kids younger than 14 aren't also going through this kind of thing? Mr. Wilson tells Bruno that he got into early admission at Caltech, but Bruno isn't sure about jumping on this opportunity. You know that part in the movie where someone comes in to the main character and they say, you want to be a Jedi? Or you want to answer phones of a demanding but impossibly chic magazine editor. As before, Mr. Wilson only knows how to speak to these kids in movie references, and in this case, Star Wars and The Devil Wears Prada. But despite knowing so much about movies, Wilson is failing to acknowledge that a classic step in every protagonist's journey is the refusal of the call. Luke Skywalker rejects Obi-Wan Kenobi initially and only leaves Tatooine once his aunt and uncle are killed. In Devil Wears Prada, Andy initially walks out of the interview with Miranda Priestly, thinking she blew the interview and tries to quit several times before finally deciding to take the job seriously. So Bruno is at the refusal of the call stage. Let Bruno have his beats. So after school, Kamran waits for her by his sweet ride and notice how the sun glares off the hood, blinding her with the light again. Last episode, all these lens flares, blinding lights representing Kamala being distracted. And I love the block in here. Bruno blocks that light, gives her a relieving shade, trying to keep her away from this bad, bad boy and shielding her from the blinding light. Also, you'll notice how Bruno wears a blue shirt and a red vest, which is a nod to the comics when Kamala had a kid who sat behind her in class dressed up as Marty McFly, who doodled Teen Wolf in his notebook. Cameron and Kamala chat some more about Bollywood stars. Mine's the same. She still has a huge crush on Kingo Senior. Ew. Concerning. Very. <laughs> They're referring to the movies of Kingo, Kamel Nanjiani's character in Eternals, a Bollywood star who would reinvent himself as a younger generation era after era. Cameron goes on to say, Yeah, I mean, it must be a generational thing because I don't really understand half the things my mom's into. A very important line when you consider the context that Cameron may be a generational inhuman as well. Their ancestors having an extraterrestrial link. Maybe Najma was into Kingo knowing he's an ageless eternal, not originally from Earth. Pretending she is much younger than she really is is something that she also does. Amir catches them. This is Cameron. He's our cousin. Our cousin? <laughs> the ending of this episode does imply that they may actually be related. Hopefully he's adopted because otherwise, why are you hitting on her like that, dude? At dinner, Yusuf says, That's why we moved to America, right? So that our children could be anything that they wanted to be. Almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a common hope of all immigrants, but might have a deeper context if Muniba doesn't want Kamala to be a cosmically powered inhuman. Yusuf goes on to say, Muniba's family moved to Karachi only after the partition. Back then, there was no Pakistan or Bangladesh. It was all one big country, India, after the British just... The made. British left us with a mess. So the partition refers to when Great Britain parted ways with British India in 1947, and the subcontinent divided into India and Pakistan, separating the military, the civil service, railways, treasury, millions of people along religious lines, Muslims to Pakistan, Hindus to India, displacing 10 to 20 million people, causing horrible ethnic violence, resulting in deaths estimated from several hundred thousand people to two million people. It was a horrible dark time, one of the worst refugee crises we've seen in human history. Yusuf explains how Muniba's mother was caught up in all that, a toddler on the last train out of a station and got separated from her parents. Nobody knows how a little toddler, Sana, managed to get back on the train just, just before, before the train pulled out of the station. I like how Amir completes this part of the story, but then Yusuf turns to Kamala to finish the second part of the story about how the toddler made it back to her father. She followed a trail of stars. Right back to her father. And I like how there's some subtle musical chimes here. Like it was some cosmic magic at play in this history. A trail of stars referring to cosmic intervention, Cree tech, inhumans that Sana and her mother Aisha used to survive. Maybe even a Cree starship transporting her back to her father. Trail of stars also sounds like something America Chavez might have helped out with, using a path of star portals to teleport Sana back to her father. Now, this would have been almost 80 years prior. I'm not really sure how aging works in other dimensions like the Utopian Parallel, but it's just worth bringing up, Trail of Stars, you know? But when Yusuf mentions that Maniba's mother disappeared, the bangle glows, a white portal opens, and Kamala's eyes glow purple, as they did last episode when she was transported to the other realm. In this case, a woman appears with a purple-tinted face, and this is Neymar Busha's character, credited as Najma. I'm thinking also Kamala's great-grandmother, Aisha, that Kamala's nani, Aisha's daughter, said previously owned this bangle. And the purple color on her face could make her one of those purple entities from Kamala's vision. I believe all of them representing Aisha's other in human family and Kamala's broader ancestry network. But listen closely to the sound effects here. You can hear a train whistle. 
There is also the sound of a train under Najma in the back seat in the final shot. Both of these train sounds could be a nod to Aisha getting separated from Sana and Sana's father at that train station, and Aisha later helping Sana find him using that trail of stars. Now, later in this episode, the Illuminantes will gossip about Aisha. My father called her a snake. She put a curse on everything she touched. I heard that she had a secret affair and took off with someone. I heard she had many affairs and she had a secret family. I heard she killed a man. Happened during partition. Yes, just some hot goss, of course, but it might be rooted in truth, just from a different point of view. Like Aisha may have had another family of inhumans. She might have killed someone in self-defense and her powers back then probably were viewed as a curse or some kind of superstition. I just love how this series grounds Kamala's family history in the partition between India and Pakistan, real world history, when many lives were lost, many families were separated, and many at that point in history were ostracized as others. Something that could apply doubly to Aisha as an inhuman in the 40s that would stir up these rumors and superstitions about her in that community, leading to her just getting separated during the partition and letting her family go so that they could have a normal life. Yet still, an inhuman gene would have been left in the women of this family, a legacy that Maniba fears is a curse, feeling shame over it. But now, Kamala has it and it has been activated. They attend the Eid festival at their mosque, or Eid al -Adha. Kamala jokes with Naki and Bruno about the Illuminantes. The Illuminantes, actually, they know everything. We later meet them and Nakia's breakdown of the different groups of this community, which is just pretty interesting timing for Multiverse of Madness to introduce us to the 838 Illuminati. I would love it if this is the Illuminati of the 616 universe. And here in the animated title, the A is the all-seeing eye of the Illuminati conspiracy theory. We also meet the Mosque Bros, which actually includes a cameo by Bilal Fala, the co-director of episode one and episode six. Then the Pious Boys have the same hands together image as Kamala's Bismillah drawing in episode one, but notice how the hands separate to reflect that that gap that Nakia refers to. And then the InstaClick has Instagram labels like tag, blessed, Dean, Dean being a term in Islam for staying devout under Allah. Then DODC agent Cleary interrogates Zoe. You're not the Zoe Zimmer. The only one I know. What? You have got to be kidding me. I'm a big fan. Wait, really? Yes, everyone in the office is. Yeah, Cleary knows that flattery is everything to youth suspects, similar to how he's able to get Ned to confess his role in No Way Home. But of course his tone shifts. And then the, uh, Enhanced individual tried to kill you. Aha, enhanced. That was the code term that the MCU used in place of mutants back in Age of Ultron. In this case, it seems to be a catch-all term for any rogue superpowered person, mutant, inhuman, super soldier, Hulk, anyone beneath the tier of Sam Wilson's big three. What big three? Androids, aliens, and wizards. But then Agent Deaver joins interrogation and uh, Did she have an accent of any kind? Was she Latina? I'm sorry, I'm supposed to say Latinx now, right? Middle Eastern? South Asian. Yeah, Cleary's expression suggests he objects to this kind of racial profiling, but then he says, Let's do the tri-state sweep. Search every temple, community center, and, and mosque. Just be respectful. The FBI is already surveilling, let me know that. They do leave Ariane Moayed off screen, but you can hear in his delivery a bit of hesitation right before he says mosque. And then they include the mention of the FBI because yeah, since 9-11, the FBI has been monitoring mosques and Muslim community centers all over the country, a shift from the Bureau's focus on domestic terrorism in the 90s after the Oklahoma City bombings. And wouldn't you know it, that white nationalism didn't go anywhere. At the festival, a kid hangs from the tower, so Kamala has to suit up and cosplay to save him. I love how she tries to calm him down. Yeah, what, do, you, do you have a favorite food? Ice cream pizza. Did someone say ice cream pizza? <laughs> I love how Najaf the vendor just got an idea for a new food to sell. This guy better be selling ice cream pizza next episode. Kamala lily pads over to him and tries to catch him, but when the hard light gives out, she has to form another landing pad, saving the day, we think, hopping off, forming another pose, just like her fantasy self did in episode one, copying Black Widow. We see a frenzy of social media posts about this rescue, also commenting on the hilarious combination of pizza and ice cream. I love all these memes, but they include one from Frogman Jules, and we will see Frogman and She-Hulk, Eugene Patillo, as that goofball in the spring loaded frog suit that he got from his father. This angle of this photo of Kamala falling is from above with the hard light below her. So Frogman must have been leaping over them to get this photo of this moment, doing nothing to save them. But then again, we also don't know if these memes are actually in real life or just Kamala's imagination of how she thinks everyone will love her because of this. Probably the latter. But Kamala's concentration is broken when her great grandmother appears to her. So the hard light flickers out and the kid falls again. Kamala's imbigant hand fails to catch him. So she has to slow his fall with just more hard platforms leading to a pretty hard landing. Oh, 
come on, kid, you already know it's your ankle. Kid's trying to get Kamala a yellow card. Kamala faces a drone that looks like a dark painted customized Stark drone from Spider-Man Far From Home and No Way Home, also cameo in Multiverse of Madness. Remember that? That was weird. Now remember, the DODC and other agencies confiscated these drones so they would be in possession of them, but they don't necessarily have full control over Tony's Edith software, which might be why the drone's inner interface looks different than it did in Far From Home. Deaver shows up with DODC agents armed with these handheld sonic cannons. This should look familiar to you. This is more Stark tech, first seen in the 2008 Hulk film. It was a Stark Industries design when they used it on the Virginia campus, but Tony also added these to War Machine's armor in Civil War when he used it on Wanda Maximoff. These were also on the Stark drones in Far From Home, blowing Peter off of Tower Bridge, and we see these same guns in the She-Hulk trailer, suggesting it is the DODC there in that show. Also, a crazy detail in episode one, if you're looking closely, looks like there is a photo of Jamila Jamil on the DODC's wanted posters in that post credit scene. Jamil is playing the supervillain Titania in She-Hulk. So since we see these guns in the She-Hulk trailer, that might mean the DODC is the same agency that Jennifer Walters is dealing with in that series. And if Matt Murdock dealt with the DODC in No Way Home, it's just one more way Daredevil could cross over into She-Hulk. It's all connected! Kamala wrecks these drones just as effectively as Peter Parker did, but the sonic cannon obliterates her hard light, making it look so brittle. And I think this hard light is actually meant to look wrinkled and creased to deliberately evoke paper mache, as if this is glowing paper mache as Kamala's powers were activated while she was wearing paper mache Captain Marvel cosplay. As I explained in my video where I interviewed the directors, this form of Kamala's powers is intended to be a temporary look that Kamala will evolve past. And I think this hard light is really pieces of her Terrigen cocoon that she's gradually shedding off until she reaches her final form. Cameron's timing is amazing as he swoops in to pick her up, but in the backseat is a ghost. Kamala, I've been waiting a very long time to meet you. It's all connected? Oh, because if Najma, AKA the woman from the visions, is Kamala's great grandmother Aisha, and if she's also Kamaran's mother, that would make Kamaran Kamala's grandmother's brother, or half brother if he was born to a different father, but still, Kamaran might be Kamala's grand uncle. Thor, hook up Kamala with an escape here. He's adopted. Now, of course, it is very odd that Najma is still relatively young. If she's her great-grandmother from the 40s, she should be older, right? Well, Najma may instead just be a sister or cousin to Muniba, who just looks a lot like their great-grandmother. Might still be a relative that Muniba left behind in Pakistan, who in that case would make Kamran Kamala's cousin. But no, I don't think so. Najma looks exactly the same to these visions. And in those visions, she wore older clothes, had an older hairstyle. So I think Najma is the same person as Aisha. And the agelessness is because she is an inhuman, the curse that the Illuminantes were talking about. Najma and and Kamran might be inhumans, and humans are known to live two to three times longer than humans are, age more slowly. Now I know you might say, Eternals don't age at all, and Kamran did mention Najma liked Kingo movies. I just doubt that these characters would be ID'd as Eternals as well. There are only 10 Eternals on the planet, they were synthetic aliens, they don't really reproduce or anything. I really just think Najma liked Kingo because she identified another ageless figure hiding in public. Of course, another possibility to consider is that Najma might just be a scroll taking on the identity of Aisha's appearance. The rumors that she she was the snake could come from Aisha having a Skrull partner that she would trade places with, the way Fury and Talos have a partnership. Since in the comics, Kamran actually serves a villain called Lineage, Najma here might be this show's version of that character. It just remains to be seen whether she is truly villainous or someone who's actually trying to help her. But also we should point out, Carol Danvers' cosmic power up and ensuing Kree transfusions left her in a state in which she didn't really age from 1995 to 2023. So all of this might just be a symptom of Kree tech and cosmic radiation. And I just think it's so ironic that Kamala began this episode joking about how, like Ant-Man, she looks younger than she really is, and now that seems to be a genetic trait that she inherited. This is a breakdown of Ms. Marvel episode three, which gives Kamala 10 rings problems in a Gen 8 one. I don't know if that made sense, but let's break down this episode shot by shot for all the Marvel Easter eggs and details you might have missed, because there is so much to explain from the opening minutes of this episode. We open in British-occupied India in 1942, making this a few years before the partition mentioned in last episode, that's when the British left India by dividing it into India and Pakistan, resulting in devastating civil unrest. We find ourselves in a cave containing various ancient relics. Digging through this rubble is Najma, Faria, Salim, and Kamala's long-lost great-grandmother Aisha. I found the bangle. Should we be concerned it's on a severed arm? You heard what that man from the temple said. He said we would need two. So where's the other one? I told you. 
The British have probably looted this place twice over by now. And as the British army realizes their intrusion, they burn down this location, and we get this overhead shot revealing the floor is carved with the symbol of the Ten Rings. Whoa, boy! But really, the key detail here is that they find this bangle on a severed blue arm, which indicates to us that it may be Kree. Kree are humanoid extraterrestrials in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, many of whom are blue-skinned, Kree being the society that Carol Danvers ended up with, and Captain Marvel, most of them are imperialist pricks. Kree technology is partially the source of Carol Danvers' power-up. It was a lightspeed engine powered by the Tesseract, the Space Stone, followed by a bit of Kree transfusion. It was the Kree who invented the Terrigen Mist, the process that creates in humans, and what gave Kamala her powers in the comics. So this Ten Rings logo might mark this as the location when Wu discovered the Ten Rings. In the comics, the Ten Rings are alien McLuhan technology discovered by the Mandarin in the wreckage of a McLuhan ship. The Shang-Chi film only hints at where Wen Wu found these rings. So this place may be that tomb or crater where Wen Wu found the rings. And that these rings were extraterrestrial technology, but not from the McLuhans like they are in the comics, but in the MCU from the Kree. This could be a Kree crash site containing other relics of ancient Kree technology. This group sent here by a man in the temple whom I believe to be Wen Wu. Wen Wu has had the rings for over a thousand years, and this helmet that Berea finds looks like the kind worn by the Ten Rings cavalry in that Shang-Chi prologue, or at least worn by by an army that they conquered. We are in the Indian subcontinent here, but the Ten Rings Empire spanned the whole Asian continent from China to Afghanistan. Many have speculated that the bangle is connected to the Ten Rings because if you look closely, it does illuminate very similarly to the way the Ten Rings do. Remember, in the Shang-Chi post credit scene, Wong, Banner, and Carol Danvers analyze those rings. They're not vibranium. Chitauri? Not like any alien tech I've seen. How long did your dad have them before he gave them to you? About a thousand years. The thermal luminescence indicates they're older than that. Now, Carol might be familiar with modern Kree tech, but if these rings were ancient Kree tech, it would predate any expertise that she had. So I believe ancient Kree sent a dispatch to Earth thousands of years ago, perhaps alerted by the arrival of the Eternals, or maybe the even earlier arrival of a vibranium meteorite to Wakanda, which I think was the nexus moment that really gave the true birth of civilization and technology to this planet in the MCU. I think that ancient Kree dispatch could have brought with them the Ten Rings and the two bangles, maybe also technology like Terra Genesis. Sometime after that, the rings were recovered by Wen Wu. Maybe there was some kind of conflict where he severed the arm of that warrior with the bangle. So why now would Wen Wu give this group valuable information? Maybe it wasn't Wen Wu, maybe it was a rival of his. But remember, in Shang-Chi, Nan explained the realm of Talo. We have cities that surpass any in your universe, rich with culture and history. Thousands of years ago, all of our people lived in peace and prosperity until the attack of the Dweller in Darkness. So this implies that the Dweller of Darkness must have come from some dimension beyond Talo, as these folks are interdimensional beings from beyond when Wu might have made a deal with these devils for him to keep the Ten Rings so that they could take the bangles. Now, the most important detail from that post credit scene was that the Ten Rings were releasing some kind of pulsing beacon that was summoning something or someone. Now, I think it will be revealed to be the Kree. As the rightful owners of this technology, this being a very important relic to their culture, and with Secret Invasion coming up, I think we're going to learn about the Kree Skrull Shadow War that's been happening behind the scenes, and that's going to erupt into an all out cosmic war in which Carol, Kamala, and Monica are going to have to defend Earth from a Kree invasion. I think that is going to be the plotline of the Marvels next year. So, where is the other bangle? Faria says the British had already looted this tomb, which is an important clue. It could be in one of those London museums we visited recently where Cersei and Dane worked, or where Stephen Grant worked, or where Killmonger visited. That relic could be among the possessions of Dane's own uncle, along with the ebony blade that we saw in the Eternals post credit scene. It could be an artifact held by MI-13, the Supernatural Investigation Division, where Blade and Black Knight had both worked, and we know the two of them are now together from that post credit scene. Or it could be in damage control storage, along with the Chitari tech and the Ultron heads that we saw in Spider-Man Homecoming. Aisha snaps on this bangle, her eyes turn purple, as they did for Kamala. Presumably she got a glimpse of that Nord dimension, as Kamala did. But because Aisha was from that dimension, she cannot fully connect with this bangle the way Kamala can, since she was born in 
this dimension. And then we jump to the present where we realize Najma has been telling this story to Kamala, and Najma reveals that she and Aisha and the others were exiled from another dimension called the Nor dimension. Nor meaning light. And they all have some degree of Nor in them, but in lesser quantities, still slowing down their aging. However, Kamran is 17 years old, so don't worry, no one's going to jail. Well, he does go to jail this episode, but you know, not for that. Najma says the bagel helped Kamala unlock her Nor, and maybe someday something will help Kamran unlock his, hinting that he will probably power up into his blue bioluminescent inhuman form from the comics. But then we meet the last one of their group who's only hinted at in the opening scene. His name is Adam. Popcorn, popcorn. Don't mind him. We've been around for a hundred years and he picks the stupidest parts of humanity to be obsessed with. That's so rude. His name being Adam is significant, as when they argue off screen, the captions show he says this is his house. He's more confident than the others, and there might be some significance to that because Najma says, In our home dimension, the Noor dimension, we're known as clandestines. As to what we are, we've been called Ajnabi, Majnu, Unseen, the list goes on. But what we're most commonly known as is Jin. I'm sorry, did you just say Jin? Okay, wow. So the term Jin was actually mentioned back in episode one. Please tell Bruno the Zuzu is possessed by the evil Jin. He needs to fix it. Jin refers to a spirit or a demon in Islamic mythology, actually pre-Islamic mythology as Yusuf clears up later. They've been anglicized as genies, which basically just means white culture says bastardize this culture. They've turned the concept into like jacked blue Will Smith rapping. But Jin absolutely have a deeper lore to them. The idea is that whereas humans were understood to be made from clay, the Jin was made from smokeless fire and are forbidden to interact with humans and are actually invisible to us. By the way, the other terms that Najma mentioned, Ajnabi is Arabic for strange, alien, or foreign. Majnun is Turkish for a crazy person. And unseen may have a deeper meaning to it in Marvel lore. Unseen has been considered to be invisible to the Watchers, but I think she was using it in the context that Jinn are supposed to be invisible to mortals. But the key word there was clandestine, which was capitalized and I think might be referring to a lesser known group in Marvel Comics from the 90s founded by Adam of Ravencroft, Adam, later dubbed Adam of Destin from 12th century England, who during the Crusades fell in love with a Jinn. Their descendants become the clandestine, all with various different powers, and they team up with the X-Men, and don't feel bad if you don't know they existed because they were never popular. I guarantee you, even the nerdiest Marvel fan who watched this episode today had to do a bit of Googling to figure out who these guys were. But I think that was by design. Their obscurity and their intersection with Jin mythology being the reason why this term was chosen here. Now, to be clear, this group is only 100 years old. Really, it's their extra dimensional status and the fact that they identify with being Jin, something important to pre-Islamic mythology, being far more important to who they are in in this story. The fact that the biggest a-hole in the group is named Adam, I think just a nod to Adam of Ravencroft, Adam of Destine. I'm thinking that their Nord dimension is actually another spiritual afterlife realm in the MCU alongside the Ancestral Plane and the Duat, as Tuaret and Moon Knight explained that both the Duat and the Ancestral Plane were part of an array of interlinked afterlives that all take different forms based on the beliefs of the individual. And now to be clear, the concept of the Jinn far predates 100 years when these exiles arrived into our dimension. So really, Jinn is just what they were called and how they explain what they are, but they are not literally Jin, and it remains a mystery why they were exiled and what it says about that dimension that authorities there exile souls from that realm and leave us with them. What I love most about all this is that it is grounding the mythology of Kamala Khan and the whole Khan family and her powers in faith. That seems to be a thematic undercurrent of Phase 4, with stories like Thor, Love and Thunder, Eternals, Moon Knight, and soon Black Panther Wakanda Forever, all exploring the theme of how for many of these characters being a superhero is deeply intertwined with their spiritual beliefs. And I think this is awesome because the MCU may be about to establish that all paranormal folklore beings in this world, vampires, ghosts, demons, werewolves, Bigfoots, chupacabras, musks, are exiles from other spiritual realms, other dimensions. And assuming one of those dimensions is hell, I guess we got a pretty good look at that in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. You know what that means. Not today though. Now the opening title includes Kamala's notepad drawing showing Captain Marvel with a heart on her chest, Iron Man with the heart on his chest and palm repulsor, Hulk, and then this sexy dude going, oh hi. Another is cut paper with KK labeled on the scissors, and then another is a drawing of Kamala totally falling over Kamran. Also, a quick reminder that the best way to support New Rockstars is to get our Ms. Marvel inspired Cosmic Daydream shirt at NewRockstarsMerch.com, where you'll get the added option to write in a custom shout out for our Ms. Marvel after shows. Kamala tries to explain this all to Bruno. I'm a Jin. 
And tonic? Solid joke, I love it. The books on Bruno's shelf include Mechanical Behavior of Materials, Turning the Wheel, Hacking Darwin, How to Manage Your Mother, How the Mind Works, Mr. Monster, and on top of an issue of Popular Science, Kamala asks, Do you know anything about interdimensional travel off the top of your head, specifically the Nord Dimension? That's N-O-O. -O. Actually, no, that reminds me of a paper I read. Uh, I think it's by Dr. Eric Selvig. Perfect. Yes, Eric Selvig, Thor and Jane Foster's astrophysicist buddy from the Thor films and Age of Ultron, and now, based on the in-flight movies in Spider-Man Far From Home, something of a Neil deGrasse Tyson figure in the MCU. Bruno shows Kamala that she's trending, that TikTok post from a guy named Miguel with hashtags including mosque saved, girl on roof, nightlight, and Jersey City hero. DODC agent Deaver's license plate is 0102EE. In WandaVision, Wanda envisions license plate when they first drove into Westview in episode one was 0102. She's struts into the mosque, her shoes making hard thuds on that carpeting, just so rude of her and these agents to enter with their shoes on. Nakia tells them to get a warrant. Nakia Badir, mosque board member. You still have few more boards to count. Okay, all right, perspective member, but I feel good about our polling. Yeah, there is a lot of ADR in this episode. That's where they bring in actors afterwards to dub in audio that they just kind of layer in in post-production. And by the way, they do that all the time in movies and TV shows. Usually it's very subtle, but this one was totally my favorite. Nakia's political rival wanting to make sure all the votes were counted. A detail that I love because if you think about it, Kamala's rescue in the Eid festival when they campaigned was the day before. So when was this election held? During the festival? This morning at the meeting? How many people voted? How long were the polls open? I mean, this guy is totally right to demand some election security here. Kamala watches a TikTok video on her desktop? That's weird. The comments include a bunch of little Easter eggs, including one from Queen Zainea, she could save me anytime, one from Royal Ruby, Nightlight saves people left and right, the real Euro King saying Captain Marvel wannabe, and I assume this is actually Najaf, the Euro vendor. Hummy Drizzle replies to him saying, yeah, she can't even fly. Euro King also comments, I don't know what everyone is so hyped about, she broke the kid's leg, but then beneath that, GWW, not the bridge, defends her saying she saved him he would have fallen without her. Now GWW could refer to Ms. Marvel co-creator G. Willow Wilson or maybe the guidance counselor Mr. Wilson named after her. And then there's a comment from Fizan the Man and the real Zoe Zimmer. Oh Zoe you always just gotta be where it's happening don't you? Outside of the party Kamala has this heart to heart with her sheik who advises good it's not a thing you are Kamala. Is a thing you do. Yes, reminding Kamala that her status as a great granddaughter of a clandestine is really irrelevant. It's her own choices now that define her. We see Bruno has given Kamala a superhero mask and he put it in a shoebox. If you look at the side of that shoebox, it is size 13 men. Damn, Bruno! In the Circle Q, Bruno studies Selvig's paper on his laptop, and you can see an Einstein Rosen Bridge illustration, aka a wormhole, and he refers to the events of New York City in 2012, aka the Battle of New York, something he was very involved with, considering Loki used a Mind Stone on him. There's also some language asking if we should leave this dimension or not. Dr. Selvig doing the work that soon characters like Reed Richards and Kang will be building on. Yusuf drops in for a hostess fruit pie, which is a classic Marvel Comics deep cut for when like Spider-Man or the Avengers would randomly plug hostess fruit pies in panels. A very forced and cringy thing that Marvel Comics used to do, as you said hints at with this meta line. There's just something about their syntheticness. <laughs> I just can't resist them. <laughs> Yusuf translates some Urdu text about the jinn. Legend tells of a group of hidden jinn, exiled from their home world and damned to live out their days trapped in our own. They move in shadows searching for the key that will help them get home. But to unlock such an ancient barrier will require a primordial power. Later with Bruno, Kamala wears an Iron Man shirt and rubs her knee, telling us that her Noor doesn't necessarily give her rapid healing powers. Bruno tells her that they'd need the energy the size of the sun to open a portal through dimensions, which could wreak havoc on this dimension. Kamala says, Carol Danvers went away. She'd punch a hole in space and time and she'd help them now. I think Carol Danvers would be reckless. Maybe it's not such a bad thing that you're not her. Yeah, I'm so glad someone said it. Avengers, including Captain Marvel, are not good role models. Higher fest further, baby. Also, I'm sorry I burned the city down. Oh, well. When Kamala texts Kamran, a QR code appears to her left on the wall. Every episode, there is a hidden QR code somewhere in the shot, where if you scan it with your phone, it'll take you to a link that actually updates every week with a new free Ms. Marvel comic. And this week, it's the magnificent Ms. Marvel number one from 2019, which frames Kamala as a bedtime story hero called The Destined One. This episode's title is Destined. All the story beats 
leads this episode with the family wedding, all the heart to hearts between Maniba and Kamala, between Yusuf and Amir. They're all just so wholesome and sweet and wonderful. We get to learn so much about the family and this culture, and it is a delight. One detail that I really liked is Amir being shoeless throughout the event. This is actually a game ritual called Juta Chaptai, in which the groom's shoes are stolen and the groom must beg or pay ransom to get them back before he can leave the venue. My dumb theory this week is that Nick Fury got his shoes stolen on the Skrull space station because he was currently getting married that day to a South Asian woman. Probably wrong, probably wrong. I just want to know why they took his shoes. And during the amazing dance sequences, the will notice the nephew is wearing the padded Hulk outfit that Maniva stitched for Kamala and Yusuf in episode one. The wedding band is Brown Jovi, a Bon Jovi cover band, calling back the family's love of the New Jersey Prince in the past episode. Kamran shows up to warn Kamala, but also to screw over Bruno. He knows his name isn't Brian. There's a legitimate jealousy there. And as I mentioned before, some of his lines here were definitely picked up later via ADR. Kill everyone, you have to get out of here. Hey. I think you should leave. Kamala, everyone will die. I am guessing that an earlier cut of this episode didn't properly have Kamran establishing the life or death stakes of Najma's crew. But also, are they gonna kill everyone? We don't really know what the clandestine's power set was. They don't really seem that scary. A lot of this part seemed a bit hastily edited together. But still, there's a lot to love here. Like the amazing needle drop to have Bon Jovi's living on a prayer during this chaos. This whole episode establishes Kamala's powers. As grounded in her spiritual beliefs, she is literally living on a prayer. Now, at first, actually, that Brown Jovi kept playing through this, which would be nuts, but you can see them running off in the chaos. But still, that means they set their break music to continue to play, and those break tracks are all Bon Jovi songs, which is also really funny. Another little detail here, after worrying about not having enough money in his bank account, during this panic, Amir smartly goes for the cash and grabs it off the plate. The clandestines turn out to be a real bunch of a-holes. Adam straight up punches a cook who wasn't even in his way. Absolutely not. <laughs> Ah, oh, I love that extra. Give her a spinoff. There are some goofy signs posted throughout this kitchen, like on the dry erase board, 63 days without incident? How bad was that incident where they had to keep track of their days without one? Then a teal sign on the walk-in cooler that says, please do not enter this cooler unless you specifically need something in here. This cooler is to remain locked at all times. Whoa, yikes. I assume they also meant to put up a sign that says, also please refrain from saying the words longing rusted furnace daybreak because we keep winter soldiers frozen in here. What the hell? And yes, we do not really get a clear sense of the clandestine's power set. They seem to have some super strength, like they crack the floor tile and send Kamala flying after they punch her Nora shield. Adam taps a chest pendant, transforming it into a melee weapon. But that shot is so dimly lit that we can't really make out this transfiguration. Faria just shows up with a spear. Selim turns his belt into this whip-like blade. I think this is actually a bend blade called Narumi. Kamran and Najma both have weapons, but we don't really see where they tap them from. I mean, hey, it wouldn't be Disney Plus without a, a mid-season moment, right? It especially just feels a little lame when they can all get taken out by DODC Hulk sonic cannons and then get arrested like Scooby-Doo villains. I mean, no offense to these clandestines, I just don't blame the Nord Dimension for being like, uh, we're good, we're good, you stay out. We do get a cool moment where Kamala's Nor light and biggins her fist to punch Selim and save Bruno, and then her arm just stretches to clear the room. There's a very important moment where Najma grabs Kamala's bangle and a portal opens showing the train with Karachi on it. It is a steam engine train, something from the 40s. I am thinking the clandestines betrayed Aisha by pushing her in front of that train after Aisha refused to disclose that she gave that bangle to Sana. Nakia realizes Kamala is that nightlight hero she's been mad at, and she completely savages Bruno. Nakia will take care of me. Wait, no. Just go. Kamala refuses to admit to her family that she did pull the fire alarm and ruin the wedding. And then her nani, Sana, calls telling Kamala that she and Muniba need to come to Karachi ASAP. Did you see the train, Mita? You have to come to Karachi. This is a breakdown of Ms. Marvel episode four, which takes Kamala to Pakistan for even more boys to fight over her. You get yours, Kamala. From hidden realms to Ant-Man murals in Urdu, let's break down this episode frame by frame for all the details you missed, because there is so much to explain here. Unlike previous episodes, this opening previously on segment switches to Urdu, as much of the visible text this episode does, including the closing credits as this series transitions from Jersey City to Karachi, Pakistan. Over the Marvel fanfare, the music is Summer Nights by Raginder featuring Wisechild, foreshadowing Sana's later description of the night she was separated from Aisha at the train station. It was the middle of partition. 
and it was a hot summer night. A tragic summer night Kamala revisits in the episode's final scene. The opening shot shows outside of the plane window, a cloud looming over the city of Karachi with the wing light shining through. And for a second, it evokes the existential threat facing this dimensional plane, revealed later this episode, the veil of Noor collapsing in the alternate realm of light flooding this one. It has been some time since Kamala ruined Amir's wedding and she hasn't heard from her friend Nakia. She scrolls through her texts quickly, but they read, I'm so sorry, please answer me, I'll explain everything. Hopefully you're all okay and no one is hurt. I wish things could go back to normal and like they were before. Please say something, anything. I don't know why I thought I could be a hero. It's so much harder than I thought. I don't know what else to say or how to fix this. I'm really sorry. Please just let me know you're okay. Though I don't know why Kamala expected new text to come in. She's been on an international flight and the plane isn't really low enough to get a cell signal unless she's using the in-flight Wi-Fi. But even then, since it's an international flight, wouldn't she have to switch her SIM card? I don't know. She might just be doing that thing where she's reviewing a bunch of texts that she sent right before the flight departed. And now as the flight is landing, she's waiting for a new signal. Panic waiting for what that response will be. Because I always do this. I'm always wondering, am I fired? Am I fired? Am I fired? Does everyone hate me? Does everyone hate me? Did a trailer drop mid-flight? These are anxiety poison. I like how as they descend, people to start to stand up to get stuff out of the overhead. Can we sit down? I mean, this is the case on any flight, but especially international flights, just a very common and weird thing for passengers to do. Kamala arrives at the Karachi airport, blinded by the light of the excitement around her. We see a returning champion cricket team celebrating, and then she is showered with red flower petals, recalling her fantasy of Kamran in episode two, and she's greeted by her cousins and her nani, Sana. They pass by a mural of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, and they pass under this sign, Karachi, the city of lights, another hint of the hidden realm threatening this plane, the Noor dimension, Noor of course meaning light. This is literally the city of lights about to become a city of even more light. Now they used a number of establishing shots from the city of Karachi, but all the exterior shots with the actors were shot on lots in Thailand. Then mixed into the opening Ms. Marvel titles are a number of them written in Urdu. And I like how one of these Ms. Marvel logos is scorched into a delicious piece of naan. They arrive at Sana's home where they meet the wonderful dog of Magnum who needs to immediately become best friends with Lucky. Kamala finds Sana's study slash painting room where on the walls are newspaper clippings related to the partition. One mentions Lord Mountbatten. Addressing the Pakistan Constituent Assembly, Lord Mountbatten was a Royal Navy commander and member of the British Royal Family who oversaw the partition and was assassinated by the IRA in 1979. A fascinating episode of The Crown where he's played by Charles Dance, Tywin Lannister. You know, the show The Crown where we all have to like pretend we care about the whims of the Royal Family. Oh, my horse doesn't like me. Meanwhile, what are we doing to impair the world? Never mind that, my cousin is flirting with me. It's just one of the many reasons I like this show for telling stories about, you know, everyone else in the world. One of Sana's art pieces shows figures in shadow walking across a purple-hued cosmic backdrop looking a lot like the Noor realm that Kamala briefly dropped into when she first clipped on that bangle in episode one, and we see a bird's eye view of in this episode. After all, Sana does see those same trained visions. These are likely visions in her dreams too. Kamala and Sana chat about their background. Am I... A jinn? Of course. At least that is what my father told me. How are you so casual about this? I, I don't see what the whole fuss is about. It's just genetics. No. Ha, a bit of a pun there, genetics. Sana explains that the term gin is really just a name given to them and tells her again that story about how a trail of stars saved her on the night of the partition by reuniting her with her father at that chaotic train station. Until a trail of stars appeared and took me right back into his arms on the train. And I am assuming that this trail of stars will be revealed to either be Aisha maybe using her Noor projections to save her, or perhaps the carrier of the other bangle, like a Kree warrior, maybe a forebearer to Captain Marvel, or maybe one of the Kree created Inhumans like Black Bolt or Maximus. I'm still holding on to hope that Inhumans might come up in this show. Kamala says that she can't figure out this puzzle and keeps breaking it even more, yet Sana advises, If you have lived like I have, lost, what I have. You learn to find beauty in the pieces. Interesting wisdom for this era that we're now entering in the MCU, that a broken, fractured multiverse is more beautiful than one that makes sense. Kamala flashes back to the battle at the wedding hall in episode three, including this one shot of Adam striking her, F this guy, but notice how light flashes on him. So we are seeing him from Kamala's point of view as her Noor light activated to shield her. She has this vision as the portrait of Aisha rests beside her on the pillow, showing how she's really sharing this dream with her great grandmother. Oh. Sorry, I didn't realize you were in here with someone. 
Yeah, her cousin is joking about her sloth baby napping pillow, but Kamala was with someone here, Aisha. Kamala and the rest have to eat on the patio because of the boat club's no jeans policy, or is it a no genie policy? I'm sorry, I will leave, I am so sorry. Get out, leave right now. As they tour the city, Kamala wears her New Jersey Avenger Con shirt that she got at the convention back in episode one. Her cousin says, Oh, and is this not exotic enough for the ABCD's Instagram? You know. American born, confused, they see. I know what it means. Yeah. Yes, this is a term used by South Asian people to refer to second and third generation Americans of their same ethnicity. Might also remind you of the slang ABC or American born Chinese, which showed up in Crazy Rich Asians in one of the texts. And might also be the reference in the ABC Chinese restaurant in this episode. But I feel like none of this is for me to discuss. I am sorry, I love you all. I'm just trying to learn and I'll shut up now. At the Polaroid stand, there is a QR code. One of these, of course, appears in every episode. And this week, when you scan it, it takes you to Ms. Marvel number 12. 12 from 2015. You can read this comic for free here. This is when Kamala travels to Karachi and runs into the Red Dagger. And I love the joke here. This is a Polaroid stand. The meta joke is for us to literally take a picture with our phones of this stand. Kamala visits a train station and checks out a historic section that's under renovation. And there's a mural of Ant-Man resizing from small to large. And he's speaking a word bubble in Urdu, which translates to as powerful as an ant. And then there's a text box. You can start small and still be larger than life. Karachi Avengers series part four, telling us that this is part of a series. I love it. The artist is Sarah Hussein after Adrian Alfona. Adrian Alfona was the artist of the G. Willow Wilson Ms. Marvel series, and his name also appeared as a school founder back in episode one. And we gotta point out that this is the latest of many Ant-Man references on this series, which might just be because Ant-Man is a low stakes comedic Avenger that Kamala in the show references more than the others to balance out all the nods to Captain Marvel and Iron Man. Also, he is one of the more public facing Avengers since it was his podcast that she listened to to learn about what happened in Endgame. Also, Hawkeye did have a weird amount of Ant-Man nods that didn't really amount to anything, but it is just a reminder that people on the street level of the MCU are all about Ant-Man and Pimtech. And I really hope that we do see a version of Kamala's powers where she can truly resize the way Ant-Man can. She's then attacked by the Red Badger, Kareem, also from this run of the comics, a vigilante from Karachi who actually ends up moving to Jersey City. He asks her, Do all masked American have superpowers? Well, how do you know I'm not Canadian? Yeah, I met a joke here. Iman Vellani is Canadian. Might be why she's so dang likable. Kamala uses her embiggened Nor fist to punch Kareem, and he releases a series of Nor darts that, if you look closely, actually go into Ant-Man's legs on that mural. Kamala catches a dagger in her hand the way Bucky can catch knives, but uh, she's definitely not as good at throwing it. <laughs> They end up referencing Ninja Turtles and Danky Kang, and they fight to a draw. Come with me if you want to live. What? Just kidding, I've always wanted to say that. Yes, the famous line from the Terminator, but I like how Kamala doesn't get the reference. Why? Because Terminator's a movie for dads! Just kidding, it's a movie for everyone. Everyone should watch it. Really, just T2 Judgment Day. No joke, top five movie for me. I love that movie. And I'm not even a dad, but I want to be one. As they enter the hideout, Kamala asks, Red daggers. What are you in a Pakistani boy band? Another boy band reference in the MCU. The Avengers broke up. We're toast. Like a band? Like like the Beatles? The Avengers? Yeah. That's great! Thank you! What is that? Wait, you don't have the Avengers? Is that a band? Are you in a band? Fantastic for it. Didn't you guys chart in the 60s? She meets Waleed, played by the amazing actor Farhan Akhtar, who actually starred in the movie The Sky is Pink, whose song played in the credits of last episode. He explains here... The clandestines are not like the jinn you've heard about in stories on religious texts. I mean, if Thor landed in the Himalayan mountains, he too would have been called a jinn. Yes, Walid is alluding to the concept that Thor and other Asgardians only have their Norse identities because of where on Earth they arrived. In reality, Thor is an extraterrestrial and the clandestines are interdimensional. It's just the human societies who call them jinn. Jinn really come from pre-Islamic folklore, far predating the hundred years that the clandestines have been here. Now, big announcement, the God Butcher World Tour is here and Epic Hero Shop has the merch for it. And what's more epic than the Necrosword skewering Thor's head done up in an 80s heavy metal style? Nothing, none more epic. On the Back, it's got tour stops that include realms Gore visited in the comics and places he might hit in the movie. Get it on a t-shirt or a poster or both so you can match your wall. And if you're worried about your head feeling left out, get Thor's strongest Avengers hat while supplies last. Grab these designs and mark your calendars because on July 7th, we are dropping a new latest obsession. And of course, don't forget about the Ms. Marvel collection. They got shoes and stickers, notebooks, and bomber jackets. Shop these designs and more at epicheroshop.com. While lead continues, the clandestines and Aisha are from another realm. This map shows you how our two worlds coexist. 
Whoa, a lot to unpack here. So notice how Waleed twists a knob to show the superimposition of another realm map hovering over our world map. If you were to twist that knob a bit more, who knows, we might see a different realm map. Now, these lines do not adhere to any geography, topography, or tectonic features of our planet, or align to really any places of interest in the MCU like Wakanda or New Asgard, and that is accounting for if you were to align from Waleed's vantage point. But he uses the term realm, which is different from how universe has been used in the MCU. So to be clear here, universe refers to parallel realities within a multiverse, each of which are doppelgangers of our world with variants of ourselves living in it. The 616 universe, the 838 universe, the variants we saw in What If, the alternate Manhattans that Strange in America crashed through, because notice even the honeycomb world, the tube world, the bone world, were still alternate urban Manhattans just made of different things. So set that aside while we explain what realms are. Realms refer to surrealist ethereal buffer zones between universes, where unknown beings live. So you got the Nord dimension, Ta Lo from Shang-Chi, and the realms beyond where the Dweller in Darkness originated, the Dark Dimension, the Quantum Realm, the Ancestral Plane, the Duat Underworld, Valhalla, the Gap Junction, the Mirror Dimension, the Astral Plane, the Shadow Realm from Thor Love and Thunder, Thanos' Soul Realm. All of these seem to be accessed either via death or through physical waypoints that are hidden in our reality. And a lot of the realms I just mentioned definitely have spiritual connotations, and they seem to be constant to all of the universes that I mentioned in the multiverse. Like there might be only one quantum realm that is shared by all these universes, I think. Like I'm mostly getting that from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in which they use the quantum realm to bridge different timelines, but this also seemed to be the case in Multiverse of Madness, where Clea took Strange to the Dark Dimension to fix an incursion between universes, suggesting that the Dark Dimension's a kind of neutral zone where they could look at two distinct universes independent of any one of them. Then we see another device showing the Nord dimension. There are many dimensions around us that we cannot see. This is just one of them. What is this? Aisha's home. It's connected to our world but hidden behind the veil of Nur that separates our world from this. Yes, more to unpack. The Veil of Nor is this realm's waypoint, like the waterfall that separated Earth from Talo and Shang-Chi, and the Dragon Scale Gate that separated Talo from the realms beyond, where the Soul Sucker comes from. So this Nor realm is implied to exist on a dimensional plane on top of our realm, similar to how the Mirror Dimension and the Astral Plane and the Shadow Realm exist all around us, just unseen. This might be why beings like the Jackals and Moon Knight and Gargantos were initially invisible. The Nor realm's surrealist columns tower high above the high rises of Karachi, and it glows the same color of Kamala's Noor light. This is definitely the realm that she briefly fell into back in episode one. Also look closely, on the far end of the Noor realm is a tree, which seems very important. When T'Challa entered the ancestral plane, he saw his panther spirit ancestors in a tree. To me, this indicates that the Noor dimension also has a spiritual essence to it. Also, I like how this realm assembles in this device via gray sands or grains, reminding us of the granular vibranium that the Wakandans used to depict their origins. But then Walid and Kareem warn, Noor is the energy source of that realm, the veil, the clandestines. Even your powers are made of it. If the clandestines use the bangle to tear down the veil, they'll unleash their world onto us until there's nothing left of it. Yeah, this sounds a lot like the incursions we heard about in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness when one universe collides with another universe. An incursion occurs when the boundary between two universes erodes and they collide, destroying one or both entirely. So I don't know, I may be wrong about there being a difference between universe and realm and the way Marvel Studios defines these terms, and maybe this realm incursion is meant to be the same thing as a universe incursion, but I don't know, for now, I think universes and realms are different enough to assume that they are different categories of dimensional terrains and both are just affected by the same crisis. So if we imagine each universe to be its own house in a row of cookie cutter model homes in a suburban street, realms would be the yards, the driveways, the sidewalks, the streets, the ponds, the aqua the gas lines, the avocado trees, the dog houses between all these houses. And so for two houses to collide with each other, there must be some kind of flood or earthquake that also causes the yards, the gas lines, the avocado trees to smash into those houses first. Those trees and turf and water all amounting to what a realm is, a buffer zone in between the houses. And we may have already seen some realm incursions existing in the MCU that could explain what these supernatural things are. Things like the invisible jackals, things like vampires, 
vampires. All these supernatural entities actually coming from realms, not other universes. And this earthquake in this extended metaphor could be a series of smaller tremors caused by several different disruptors like Sylvie and Loki and Peter Parker, Doctor Strange, Wanda Maximoff, all of them leading to one big earthquake causing it all to collide. Realms and universes. I don't know, I could be dead wrong about all that. That's just where my head is at right now. And in this moment, Waleed eyes the bangle. I haven't seen that before. In all the years and everything I've heard about that bangle, there was no mention of an inscription. It says what you seek is seeking you. So since Waleed can read this and the myths never mentioned an inscription, I think this was added later by Aisha, a message that the trail of stars being sought by Sana and now by Kamala is some kind of chain of extraterrestrials, Kree or Inhumans seeking them. I assuming the ones seeking them are the same entities being summoned by the beacon in the 10 rings and this inscription is a warning. Then we visit the DODC Supermax prison, which is the same facility we see in the She-Hulk trailer, meaning the abomination Emil Blonsky is also being kept in this place. Further confirmation that the authorities facing Kamala in this series is the same agency Jen Walters will deal with. We speculated this could be the Cube, the supervillain containment prison in the Nevada desert, originally a shield black site designed for gamma radiated inmates, later becoming the home base of the Thunderbolts. Notice how this structure's angular architecture does look like a deconstructed or exploded cube. The clandestines break free, Cameron getting hit with the blast of one of the DODC sonic cannons, the same ones made from the Stark Tech shrunken down versions of his Hulk repulsor that he installed on War Machine, and Najma's weapon looks like a Madubu used in a Tamil martial art. It's made of deer horns. But in this case, it looks like it's made of something different because we see it melting a lock. So apparently her weapon at least can superheat. Back in Pakistan, Sana tells Kamala the confusion between her Pakistani and Indian roots. There is a border marked with blood and pain. Yeah, it's my favorite detail this episode when it comes to the thematic connection between Sana's border and the border of the Vale of Noor. Sana explains how all political borders are a bit arbitrary and leave us divided. This episode explains how the political map we thought we knew of this planet is actually pretty irrelevant when you superimpose the maps of other realms over this one. Kamala joins Kareem's friends around a bonfire as this guy sings an Urdu cover of Didi by Cheb Khalid. Meanwhile, Sana and Maniba reconnect over going through Milk Toffee's boxes. Remember, Sana sent Kamala the bangle in one of these boxes in episode one, and after Sana and Maniba are finally honest with each other this episode, the trauma begins to heal as the next generation of women bond over eating these milk toffees. I just love the visual storytelling of this prop here. Waleed gives Kamala some fabric to wear, showing how she is piecing together her own costume, but the clandestines attack, leading to a chase in the streets of Karachi. Now they referenced Terminator earlier, I just can't help but see a parallel in the good guys on the small rickshaw versus the clandestines pursuing on the larger truck, and the Terminator John Connor and T2 on the motorcycle fleeing the T-1000 on the semi. Kamala spots a family of four way insanely trying to pile on a motorcycle. The baby should not be on that. Kamala forms a Noor ramp that rolls the truck and Kamala ends up back behind the wheel, a callback to her driving test in episode one. And just like then, she floors it in reverse initially. Waleed kills Salim and then Najma stabs Waleed and Kareem kills Adam and Najma stabs the Bengal, sending Kamala through this rift. Now these tears in the fabric of reality look a lot like the slices that Clea made in the Multiverse of Madness post credit scene when she tore an opening back to the dark dimension, which makes me think that Kamala is not going back in time here. She's really going into the Noor dimension, the light dimension versus the dark dimension. And this is really a memory that she's going into. Of course, she finds herself back on that hot summer night at the train station that Sana referred to when the families were forced to separate during the partition. It is heartbreaking to end this episode here, but I'm not sure if Kamala is truly being transported back in time. Like you could totally read this as, Kamala is going to be the one to create the trail of stars. She's gonna save her own grandmother. It's gonna be a self-fulfilling time loop. Harry Potter saving himself. Another version of hold the door from Game of Thrones. I mean, I don't know, that might be the case. I'm just leaning towards this being a memory contained within the bangle. Because as Kamala walks around, no one really looks at her or reacts to her. There's just one guy who kind of steps around her when she turns to climb the train car. And Kree Tech is known for being intertwined with memory. From Project Tahiti and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. warping certain aspects of Coulson's memory, to Carol Danvers having implanted memories causing her to see Skrulls as the enemy. So I think Kamala is on a similar journey of self-discovery that Carol was on. Similarly, witnessing this memory, but from the point of view of her grandmother or her great-grandmother. She may be walking in one of their shoes in this moment. Kamala does see a woman with her daughter, but this woman is credited as a different actress than the actress who plays Aisha. Also remember, Aisha was separated from Sana in this moment. Sana would have been with her dad and then separated from her dad as well. And then the trail of stars brought her back to her dad. I assume next episode, we will see exactly what that trail of stars was, whatever cosmic source is seeking the bangle. Again, could be the Kree 
or their Terran experiments, the Inhumans, folks, like Black Bolt or Maximus. For now, at least, folks, the Inhumans are still on the table, and the final shot does show Kamala being enveloped in steam from the steam engine as haze surrounds the masses. A visual nod to Terrigen Mist? We may have missed the mist! And again, something I love about the closing credits, the locales have been all swapped from Jersey City to Karachi. On the green traffic light from Brad Winderbaum, instead of Kamala's Bolt logo on the light, it is the Pakistani flag. Another thing they swapped out, the art of Kamala sitting on the swing now hangs from the crescent and the star of the Pakistani flag. What was the title of this episode? Seeing Red. And like Doctor Strange, Kamala was forced to go on red. In this case, go on that smoke show, Kareem. This is a breakdown of Ms. Marvel episode five, which further breaks the MCU's already broken time travel logic, but does so in the most beautiful way, while doing to the clandestines what would happen to me if I ever tried to leave this blue dungeon. I'm going to explain exactly what happened this episode, some interesting Easter eggs that you might have missed, and just some really cool visual details. This episode opens with a song called Tumera Chand by Soraya and Shyam from the 1949 Bollywood film Dilaji, which itself was an adaptation of the 1939 film Wuthering Heights, the story of a tragic romance of lovers, Kathy and Heathcliff, who are forced apart by circumstance. Kathy first appears as a ghost before her story is told via flashback, just as this episode flashback on characters thought to be ghostly Jin catching up to their tragic parting of ways. Actually, the song to Merit Chan's words translate to You are my moon, I am your moonlight, which if you think about it, is a variation on what you seek is seeking you. Kamala herself being the light that she seeks. In fact, really, the phrase what you seek is seeking you is a way to describe how all of us are on predestined paths. That loved ones and things that you seek out are also on a destined path to find their way to you. The Marvel Studios title imagery transitions to a sepia-toned grainy film stock that skips in a 4x3 letterbox aspect ratio as this becomes a 1940s newsreel explaining the partition with the newly appointed Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and we see Pakistan's political founder Muhammad Ali Jinnah, a mural of whom appeared in Karachi last episode. We see a map showing India and Pakistan dividing with territory to the rest of India demarcated for Pakistan but also a section to the east. This would go on to become Bangladesh. But initially at the start of the partition, Bengal's assembly voted to be part of Pakistan that is until 1971 when war broke out and Bangladesh secured its independence independence as a separate country from Pakistan. We also see Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian freedom fighter, arguably most influential in India's independence from British rule, who was assassinated a year after this in 1948. This episode then jumps back to 1942, which was really the year Gandhi first openly, formally began pushing for the British to just completely leave India. Aisha flees a British soldier after leaving the ruins of where they found the Bengal that was marked with the Ten Rings logo back in episode 3. We intercut from her bare feet to his boots, and then she flings an ornate dagger at him. Presumably this is her clandestine weapon, as they all can summon weapons, but it aligns Aisha more with the Red Dagger Society. Last episode, the Ms. Marvel titles flickered between English and Urdu. Now we only have one English one shown on a torn British flag, but the rest are in various languages. There's Urdu, Hindi, Gujarati, Punjabi, Bengali, Tamil, and Telugu. Actually, last week there was one in the colors of the 1992 Pakistan cricket national team, so it's just kind of fun to go through these one by one, so let's do it. After the Union Jack, there's one in Urdu showing the shadows of Muslim refugees on a wall with bullet holes in it, then one in Hindi showing a field of flowers, then another one in Urdu showing the mural of the red daggers, and we see there is one male and one female. Then there's another one in Urdu showing a photograph of refugees, then another in Hindi on a blue train car marked with NWR, India's Northwestern State Railway, hinting at the trains that they have to take out of India. Then in Assamese or Bengali, in smoke by the train tracks, then one in Hindi over a map showing the border between India and Pakistan, then another in Assamese or Bengali. Then an interesting one, a cracked border in concrete on one side, Urdu, on the lower side, Hindi, a literal partition between Urdu and Hindi matching the border between Pakistan and India. Then one in Tulugu, actually in a stylish font of Kannada, over a field of roses like Hassan's Rose Garden, overlooking a city in the mist, maybe a hint at the Noor dimension. Then one in Punjabi, stamped on a resettlement card for the Khan family. One man, one woman, one infant. Registration office 4291, India number 12. Cards like these were assigned to migrant Muslim families. Then one in Gujarati on a tapestry. Then another in Punjabi over a parody of the vintage Universal Pictures logo reading Marvel Studios Presents and a Sloth Baby production. And that of course is Kamala's YouTube channel. Then one in Tamil over a depiction of refugees. Then another in Gujarati, purple text on a cosmic background. And then one final one in Urdu, green over roses. In Hassan's village, a few kids are playing cricket. Women purchase some bracelets. And Hassan stirs up the crowd, citing Mahatma Gandhi to resist being forced off their land. The British 
soldiers break up the crowd. Aisha naps in Hassan's rose garden, roses being very important to the language and culture and the general lore of the country of Pakistan. Inside, Hassan says, You know when I saw you out there, it reminded me of my favorite poem. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. What you seek is seeking you. Yes, he's quoting Rumi, a 13th century Persian poet, a Sufi mystic, and a major influence on the entire Muslim world. Aisha is smitten and reveals her name. My name is Aisha. Aisha. She who lives. A beautiful name. Yes, she who lives, ironically, dies this episode. Some time passes, and Aisha gifts Hassan with a new walking stick as she sports one of the roses in her hair, looking a lot like Sana's painting of her that we saw last episode. They both rest their hands on her baby bump as the bangle is framed right beside it, symbolizing how this bangle will pass down through the women of this lineage. Aisha sings an Urdu lullaby, and as the division between the Muslims and the Hindus grow wider, Najma finds Aisha and gives her until sundown to retrieve the bangle so that they can go back to their home dimension. So Aisha gets the family to flee to the train station, but Hassan confronts her. Who's that woman you were talking to last night? Yeah, notice the music mixes in that menacing sting that's always been used to introduce the threat of Najma. I've been waiting a very long time to meet you. Aisha shows him the bangle, and writing appears on the cuff's outer bands. This is the inscription that she added that Waleed noticed later, quoting Hassan's recitation of Rumi's poem. Now, since the clandestine can transfigure their token weapons, this tells us that she has turned to the protective bangle as her token. Unfortunately, Najma still has her weapon, and Aisha, without any protection, gets stabbed in the stomach. As Najma walks up, Aisha warns her. It won't work. Huh, so what does Aisha know about the death trap of traveling through the Vale of Noor that Najma does not, or at least does not want to believe? Aisha may be more privy to the terms of their banishment and or more at peace with their exile. Aisha's life drains from her. What you see? Seek you. And the bangle glows as do Aisha's eyes, and this either coincides with or causally triggers Kamala's arrival through the rift in time opened up by the bangle from the present day last episode. Yes, this episode confirms that Kamala actually traveled back in time, and it was she who cast the trail of stars that saved her own grandmother. Now, this type of time travel is referred to as a closed loop or predestination, wherein unexplained anomalies from the past are later revealed to be the effect of present characters looping back to the past events to set the timeline the way it has always been. It's actually one of the more common tropes in time travel fiction. You may know it from Prisoner of Azkaban, where a mysterious Patronus that saves Harry Potter was actually cast by himself looping back to the past. Or from Terminator, where the human resistance leader John Connor was conceived by the same protector who went back in time to save his mother. Or Christopher Nolan's Interstellar or Tenet, where bizarre phenomena happen early on in the movie and are later revealed to be the same heroes looping back on themselves. Filmmakers will often default to this because these twists do pack some narrative catharsis, suggesting that the chaos of the world is actually part of a divine plan. But it also implies characters have no free will, since for their lives to even exist, they must make the choice of time travel. That choice has really been made for them. Now, you may feel this violates the MCU's time travel logic from Avengers Endgame, which suggested traveling back in time doesn't cause you to live within the past as it was, but rather form a new branch timeline, a separate reality. However, Endgame's own ending contradicts that logic with the confusion arrival of old Steve Rogers. The screenwriters claim Old Cap lived in the background of the MCU as we've known it, which violates their own branch timeline logic. Meanwhile, the directors maintain Old Cap must have traveled back to this timeline from a different reality. Ultimately, folks, the narrative priority with that final scene was not logic, it was really emotional catharsis. But then we got Loki, which gave us a lot of new rules of how time travel works in the MCU. But that series ended by suggesting that all the events of the MCU were part of He Who Remains' predestined script. The sacred timeline. And that includes even the eventuality that the sacred timeline would unravel into infinite branches. The gambit he remains posed to Loki and Sylvie was really a false choice. He knew that Sylvie would stab him and that the timeline would rupture into a multiverse. He wanted that to happen. That was part of his plan. Now, he who remains monologue and Loki's finale do remain up for interpretation. But one conclusion we can all agree on is that Marvel Studios sees themselves as master clockmakers and their universe as a predestined roadmap, a timeline engineered in universe by manipulators like Kang in specific ways that we're about
lot to learn a lot more about. So this seeming accident of Kamala connecting with her great grandmother through these bangles through time was preordained and designed by someone. And if you look closely at those branching timelines around the Citadel in the Loki finale, many of them do intersect with each other and bend backwards upon themselves. Each intersection may represent an incursion. Multiverse of Madness showed us what an incursion looks like when universes collide. Waleed shows us what an incursion looks like when realms collide. And now we are seeing what an incursion looks like when timelines collide. Now, Aisha does say here, Banga worked. Sana, it brought you back to me. I'm not Sana. Yeah, see, Aisha did not think she was opening a rift in time to summon her great granddaughter from the future. She just wanted the bangle to save her daughter Sana. So from that, I think we conclude it was not Najma stabbing the bangle in the present that opened the rift, and it wasn't Aisha's sort of prayer that opened the rift from the past. According to Loki, causality is incidental. No matter what, these points in the timeline were going to intersect, and history here just justified itself with these stimuli to trigger it internally. In this instance, it was a piece of Kree tech or some other alien tech mixed with clandestine nor magic to tear this rift into reality, the walls of which have already been weakening from all these things that have been happening in the MCU. Theoretically, this origin could have been scripted out by Kang or one of the Kangs to produce a clandestine descendant armed with Kree tech to join the pantheon of Marvel heroes in his eventual master plan to stage a Secret Wars event, or maybe by some other Kang, to produce a friend for Kang's alternate self of Nathaniel Richards Iron Lad in a Young Avengers lineup. There's a lot of ways we can read this, but hey, welcome to phase four, folks. Time travel. None of this makes sense. So yes, Kamala creates a Nor platform to create a path for Sana, but then she gets knocked by someone and the platform dissipates, but stays in this star form that is controlled by Sana herself, guiding herself back to Hassan. She was able to do this because she had some Nor magic in her blood and had the bangle. So in a sense, one bangle was reunited with another bangle, just the same one through time. However, we gotta remember there is another bangle, one for the right hand that exists somewhere hidden in this world. I am assuming among the collection of Dane Whitman's Uncle Nathan. So Kamala returns to the present where the Veil of Nor rift has opened. It glows from golden to teal color to fuchsia and it widens and widens. As Faria reaches into it, she turns into a statue of what this episode's audio description refers to as quote, black crystalline rock, which then crumbles to reveal her skeleton. And yes, this transformation does resemble the way Terra Genesis is shown in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Terra Gen Mist forms a rocky cocoon around a person and then they emerge from that cocoon as an inhuman with powers. In the clandestine's case, clearly not. But a similar aesthetic is at least worth noting. Maybe Terra Genesis will be revealed in the series as a worthiness judgment in the Nor realm, like what we saw in the Duat realm in Moon Knight with the scales of Anubis. Like in this case, as you pass through the veil, if your heart is impure, you emerge from that cocoon dead. But if your heart is pure, like maybe if Aisha or Kamala were to try to pass through this veil, they'd emerge from that cocoon transformed. Or I don't know, maybe they just wanted to show how the veil of Nor's energy differential melts you into bones like the Wrath of God in Indiana Jones. But Disney made them put up this goofy vanity curtain to spare viewers from the gorier details. <laughs> so then Najma offers herself to the Veil portal and suddenly feeling bad for leaving Kamran behind, utters his name and transfers her Nor light through the Veil, killing herself. But the way Aisha's Nor light summoned her descendant through time, or maybe it was just a random coincidence because of Kang. Yeah, 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 I know, we talked about that. Najma's Nor light redirects to Kamran, giving him the same embiggened Nor light that Kamala has, except more teal colored and apparently able to be controlled without the use of a bangle. So in the comics, Kamran Kamran isn't inhuman the way Kamala is, he's just hit with the same Terrigen mist that Kamala is exposed to. And it gives him different powers than stretchy limbs. He has blue colored inner bioluminescence. Ugh. Look folks, I am just doing my best to explain what the hell happened here. The logic of the clandestines on the show is largely unexplained. I'm not a writer on the show. This is all super inconsistent with G. Willow Wilson's comics. So uh, light is magic and can be transferred among descendants of extra dimensional beings, amplified by alien tech that's connected to the 10 rings. I guess Marvel Studios is just terrigenophobic and they will throw literally anything from Marvel lore against the wall, hoping YouTube will make sense of it for them, which, uh, yeah, yeah, you got us, hook, line, and sinker. But I always do love the use of light and color on this show, and I love how the alleyway and lighting that accompany Kamran for pretty much the rest of this episode are that same blue hue that his inhuman form is in the comics. But Kamala proves that her trip to the past was not just a dream or a vision, she brought back with her a physical item, the way Hawkeye brought back a baseball glove to the present as proof. Here the photograph actually parallels Pixar's Coco, the wayward child meeting their ancestor and returning with a family photo to heal the generational divide within their living relatives. Kareem tells Kamala, Although the US government may or may 
may not have several warrants out for my arrest. U.S. government? This guy's a Pakistani citizen. It just sounds like the Red Dagger's vigilantism has gotten the attention of U.S. agencies like the DODC and may set up Kareem to return in titles like the Thunderbolts. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be fine. He could be another one of Val's recruits, where I'm sure Kareem will just have to deal with quite a few racist microaggressions from John Walker. But Kareem gives Kamala his red scarf. I remember last episode, Waleed gave Kamala this blue vest. Sana gave her the bangle, Bruno gave her the mask, and I guess she provided her own red shoes that the mosque thief let her keep. Really, we're seeing all the components of her final form contributed to her by different influences within her community. And now the final piece of it, Muniba finds her golden necklace that previously showed Kamala's name in Urdu, but now bent to form her swishy bolt logo. I assume next episode, Muniba will complete the arc of the unused Hulk outfit and create Kamala's final superhero look, and Kamala will actually be a good daughter and wear it. In the scrapbook that they look at are some old photos of Maniba and some ticket stubs from concerts she went to, one reading Bruce, presumably for Bruce Springsteen, whom Sana calls Bruce Springfield, before Maniba corrects her to Bon Jovi. And then there's a blue ticket stub, but the blue ticket stub was for a show at the Oakland Coliseum, telling us that Maniba spent some time in the Bay Area. Kamala says, Why have I never heard of this? Which is what Maniba asked earlier about the Find My Phone feature. Then why am I only just hearing about this? Yes, the mother and daughter are more alike than they realize. Kamran finds Bruno in the alley. This interaction witnessed by a closed circuit security camera. Presumably the DODC was using the government facial recognition software. We know S.H.I.E.L.D. uses to track Loki in the 2012 Avengers. That must be how they tracked Kamran to this location. Kamran doesn't really get Bruno's Argon science joke poster. This is exactly the kind of nerd humor that Peter Parker wears on his shirts. Actor Matt Lentz actually auditioned to play the MCU Peter Parker before the role went to Tom Holland. Like every scene I watch this guy and I'm like, yeah, he could have been a pretty great Peter Parker. Kamran also doesn't know who the inventor Nikola Tesla is. He assumes it's just a poster for Tesla cars. But then one of the DODC drones, retrofitted from the Stark drones from Far From Home, appear outside the window, and Kamran uses his Noor to swat it away, blasting out the window glass, but Bruno's tchotchkes are still standing. The drone retaliates by completely leveling the Circle Q shop. Between this and Delmar's Deli in Queens that we saw in Spider-Man Homecoming, the bodegas of the New York area are under attack and we must protect them at all costs. So now with the bland desk Stein's toast and the veil of Nora closed. It seems like the final conflict of the finale will be with Agent Deaver in the DODC. And sure, maybe a trigger happy racial profiling government agency will be enough, especially with this agency returning She Hulk and maybe secret evasion. But remember, it is still a mystery where the bangle came from and how it is connected with the Ten Rings. So we may learn more about Deaver and Cleary's connections to a broader conflict with the Kree ahead of the Marvels. And of course, I think Carol Danvers owes us just a little cameo. This is a breakdown of Ms. Marvel episode six, the finale, which establishes the MCU Kamala Khan is a mutant with Kevin Feige erasing in humans faster than wanted did the mouth of their king. <laughs> From major Marvel proclamations to twisty post-credit huhs, to this episode's astute attention to detail with the MCU timeline logic, I am gonna break down everything you missed this episode and explain it all without a Home Alone chalkboard. The episode opens back in Jersey City, Agent Deaver says, This is what happens when the wrong people get powers. And the wrong people. Kids, Agent Barry. Another microaggression from Deaver, but in this case toward youths. Kids having powers is a bit of a new trend in the MCU these days. A young Avengers team up is imminent. Also, all this talk of government crackdown on superheroes does remind us a lot of a, uh, you know, mutant registration. And that too is the era we are now in. Bruno helps Kamran on the subway. So we're gonna transfer at the next stop and head upstate, okay? Upstate? from New York. You know what else is upstate New York? Uh, Westchester, a pretty good place for a mutant to run away to. Now we don't know yet if Kamran is a mutant as well. If he can harness his Norlight the same way Kamala can, maybe. Over the opening credits is a 2018 track by artist Janubi Karosh called Captain Space. It's title a nod to Captain Marvel who swaps places with Kamala in the post credit scene, likely connected to this captain's link to the Space Stone and Kree tech like the Negabands, which is what it looks like the Bengals are. We see the Statue of Liberty inexplicably green once more even though Spider-Man No Way Home showed how it was being restored to its brown copper color and No Way Home takes place before Ms. Marvel, this episode was deliberate about setting itself in 2025. So I don't know what's going on here, but when I saw the Statue of Liberty in the No Way Home trailer, remember? I was like, <gasps> X-Men 2000 reference, mutants are coming. Spider-Man. Yeah. So I don't know. I choose to interpret this as Ms. Marvel showing me the Statue of Liberty in the title that does actually end with the proclamation of mutants in the MCU as a nod to the famous climax of that 2000 film, a symbol of arrival to a new world both the immigrants of the Khan family, and we could paraphrase that poem as, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled mutants longing to breathe free. Kamala reveals her powers to her family, but they all already know. A little detail from the G. Willow Wilson's comics. Taisha asks, are your powers limitless? 
or do you have to recharge? Oh, yeah, Kamala doesn't get to answer, but this could be a nod to how in the DC Comics, Green Lantern has to recharge. The Ms. Marvel titles take us back to Jersey City. We see police tape, then a blueprint, then Kamala's hand-drawn puppets from her video in episode one, then imprinted on her high school hoodie, established 2014, referring to Kamala Khan's solo series published in 2014 initially, then in neon over the Circle Q store before it exploded, then on the school bus, then on an arm cast, because you know Bruno's arm is in a cast right now, and then on a digitized screen of an old Game Boy, or maybe a TIA calculator, then on a Jersey City police squad car, then on a train station destination board, Karachi is actually listed right above it, then the neon outlines from Kamala's fantasy with Kamran back in episode two. They're surrounded here by halal food carts, riding a hot dog past a Ferris wheel with hamburgers on it, then written as street paint, then painted on that graffiti wall among her and Bruno's cosplay pitches back from episode one. I like how all the Avengers, by the way, depicted there are ones adjacent to Ms. Marvel on the phase four lineup, including Doctor Strange, Black Panther, and Captain Marvel. And then last her pure nor form signaling the completion of Kamala's evolution on this show. Manima gives Kamala her own new suit in a milk toppies box. This is what Sana mailed the bangle to her in. And we learned in episode four, Sana kept these boxes around her home in Karachi and the women of this family bonded over eating these. Muniba began this season stitching Kamala an Avenger costume that Kamala did not want, but now Muniba makes one unique for Kamala that she needs using elements from Kamala's journey. The embroidery, if you notice, takes the form of interlocking blue cubes evoking the Tesseract, the cosmic tech that gave Carol Danvers her powers. Kamala lily pads across her Nor disc set to Chai's light switch, the lyric being, I want to see the light with no light switch, as Kamala learns this episode that her ability to manifest her light doesn't necessarily need the switch of her bangle. The bangle just kind of unlocked it. Now, Jeff, the Euro King returns. A QR code appears in his truck. If you scan it this week, it's been updated to issue number 19 of G. Willow Wilson's Ms. Marvel Last Days arc, which ends with Bruno confessing his love for Kamala, but Kamala telling him she doesn't doesn't have room in her heart for a thing with him right now. This episode ends with Bruno leaving a letter for Kamala, and we have no idea what it said or if she even read it. Also, my favorite Easter egg this episode, Nashaf's A sanitation grade is actually dated March 14th, 2025. Attention to detail proving this show is actually trying to take seriously the MCU timeline, as this show would be set in spring 2025 after Hawkeye was in Christmas 2024. In the mosque, notice how someone put their fancy shoes on the highest cubby hole on that wall? Probably to keep that short little shoe thief from snatching them. Also on top of the shelving unit, some boxes block the hidden door that we see later. This is where Nakia and the Sheik and the Mosque Bro hide the two of them. But Deaver returns to the mosque and still refuses to take her shoes off while walking out on that prayer floor. So rude. No cookies for Deaver. Nakia tries to block Deaver. Um, it's... Holy. Whoa, one of the agents totally just shoulder checked Deaver. She seems pretty isolated among her fellow DODC investigators. The DODC ain't all bad. The sheet gives Bruno and Kamran the disguises of ball caps, haram and halal, the words for forbidden and permissible. This is keeping up with the running MCU gag of using mere ball caps as disguises, starting in Captain America Winter Soldier, and then mocked in Ant-Man the Wasp. Relax, no one's gonna recognize us. What, because of hats and sunglasses? It's not a disguise, Hank. We look like ourselves at a baseball game. And in Captain Marvel. Does uh, announcing your identity on clothing help with the covert part of your job? Cameron's nor spasms. <laughs> Yeah, a little detail. I like how Kamala's Noor lights up on her hands instinctively as she covers her ears. And as Kamran screams, we can hear Nashma's voice calling out to him. This would suggest that Nashma might not be fully dead, that either her soul lives on as this Noor, maybe when her earthbound corporeal body eroded into a skeleton, her actual consciousness and her soul transferred to the Noor dimension where it now resides, and is continuing to puppet Kamran to try to carry out her evil plot to merge the Noor dimension into this one. When Kamala calls Kareem, he is examining his map that Waleed uses to show the outline of the Noor realm. Now the magnifying lens is fixed on the border between India and Pakistan, like Kareem might be seen if the recent Vale incident might have changed the border between realms. And we find out that the Red Daggers just have random boatsmen at the New Jersey Harbor ready to go at notice whenever. And secret, easy to navigate underground tunnels to get there. <laughs> Throughout the school, the posters include if you see trash, throw it away, and then stones of diversity build a path to peace, and then a comic book club, nice, and then another one for Dustin Barry for president, a nod to the set crew member Dustin Barry on the show. Nakia joins them along with Zoe Zimmer. What are you doing here? 
The theater has good lighting. It's where I film my TikToks. Remember in episode two, Kamala and Bruno tested out her powers backstage at the theater, which might be how Zoe figured out Kamala was her hero. Their plan involves them swiping hoodies from lockers and a skeleton from a science lab. Notice how Bruno just goofs around in the background dancing with one? Bruno, Mistress Death, Phase 4, hookup confirmed? And these chemicals. The chalkboard actually lists hydrogen peroxide, dry yeast, warm water, and liquid dish show, which actually are the ingredients for that elephant toothpaste foam that you see in YouTube videos. The DOD soldiers arm their sonic cannons. Now remember, these are Stark Tech, the repulsors he designed for the army to use on Hulk in the 2008 film, and then later installed in War Machine's armor in Civil War and in the drones in Far From Home. Actually, since the DODC now owns those drones, they may have reverse engineered those repulsors from the drones themselves. And here, notice how they charge by using the same charge sound effect that Iron Man's technology uses. Nakia and Zoe load some softballs together. I think Kamal should be able to tell the world when she's ready. Yeah, this is a little nod to Zoe's situation in the comics. Zoe later reveals a major crush on Nakia. Zoe herself is definitely waiting to tell the world when she is ready. The DODC agents bust in to find Bruno's AI Amazon Alexa knockoff Zuzu, which plays Coco Karina from the 1966 Urdu film Arman, sung by Ahmed Rushdi. It's considered the first real pop song of Pakistan. The fact that they cut it off by blasting Zuzu is criminal. Zoe goes live on TikTok where the comments include, hang on, help is coming, hashtag help Zoe, everyone in Jersey City get to CHS, Avengers go to Cole's High, Zoe needs you, on the way Zoe, hashtag popcorn popcorn, backup coming, Zoe squad, on I-78, we helping our girl, stop commenting, go to CHS now. And then popcorn popcorn, remember, is a callback to Zoe's low calorie video that Cleary really loved. Popcorn popcorn popcorn. popcorn. Their plan involves them confusing the DODC agents by disguising themselves all in the same red hoodies and hats, a trick that we actually saw in the 1999 remake of the Thomas Crown Affair and in my favorite episode of Nathan For You. Outside, Barry asks if he can multiply fly now, a nod to the Marvel Mutant Multiple Man. Not that mutant, Barry. So they set up one of the skeletons to stab a knife into a balloon that pops the ingredients together to make the foam. Now notice they dressed up the skeleton to look like Norman Bates' mother from Psycho. They put a wig on it, and they also put a face and hair on the balloon. It makes no sense how many steps they added to this, but I love it. Kamala and Kamran hide in this office. This is actually Mr. Wilson's guidance counselor office. Now remember, Kamran interrupted Kamala and Bruno's kiss of the wedding, and now Bruno returns a favor to be the uh, uh, kiss miss. Bruno distracts the soldiers. You know you like these moves. Hey guys, what's going on? Like, oh, Ouch! This is actually what happens whenever I try to dance. Government soldiers just come in and hit me in the face. But notice how it looks like Bruno is doing the same moves that he learned for the wedding dance. Nakia bikes into the gymnasium where the Volleyball State Champion banners also adhere to accurate MCU timeline logic. 2024 would have been the most recent season earlier that fall. They also won in 2022, 2019, and 2012. 2019, 2022 would have meant that they won two championships during the blip. I assume all the other volleyball teams were just very good. In the bathroom, there is a poster for the Hero Volunteer Club. No powers, no problem. Every bit counts. I mean, I mean, it kind of counts. Every kid who didn't have powers in the school got arrested. Kamran figures out his mother is dead. She tried to destroy everything. She was trying to save all of them. Yeah, there's that Nashma music sting again. And as Kamran steps out to attack the DODC, the sting plays for him as well. And then every time he does something really bad, it kind of seems like Najma's disembodied soul is kind of possessing Kamran in this episode. Kamran uses his nor for hostile attacks while Kamala uses her powers defensively. She forms a shield to protect both of them, but Deeper wipes it out with the big sonic cannon, just like the truck mounted one in the 2008 Hulk film. But then Kamala says it. Yes, the magic word for the comics that we have been waiting for, because this is what Kamala is supposed to do. She's supposed to embiggen. In this case, it is the Noor stretching out her limbs, and we see a slightly scaled up version of Kamala. And I love how this pays off the references throughout the series to Ant-Man, her various doodles, the mural in Karachi, her comparing herself in episode two to Ant-Man's eternal youth. Our girl finally embiggens. Now the quick editing suggests they might have had limited VFX budget to show this on screen for too long, and really few shots give us a sense of her actual scale, but there is one quick 
cut as Kamran flips over the truck of the crowd. A wide shot shows her to be about 10 feet tall. And this hero shot of Kamala with her embiggened fists is the angle of her Thor Love and Thunder uses when they added her to that movie's Marvel Studios title card. Kamala encases them both in a dome of their own nor so they can have their heart to heart. Now, while the series retcons Kamala as a mutant instead of an inhuman, I like to think that this dome does at least represent a Terrigen cocoon for them, at least metaphorically, both of them emerging from it transformed. Kamala's transformation to her final form is really the final layer of her suit armor for Jersey City community, forming a human shield, including the JCPD, all of whom have her back. And as she flees off into the night sky, the overhead shot of the crowd cheering, notice Bruno at the center of it all, just sadly pumping his fist. He's like, yeah, Caltech it is for me. Then a TikTok montage showing Paul from episode two reenacting Kamala's moves like that Star Wars kid meme. Notice how his name is Master Paul 616, a nod to the 616 universe, which this MCU is now designated as of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. We also see the Sheik, who later becomes a hot dog filter, and then the Euro King Najaf, and the Mosque Bro, and Mr. Wilson, aka GWW, not the bridge, proving that he was the guy defending Nightlight on TikTok in episode three. Then Auntie Ruby, and then this account. She looks so familiar. Yes, the real GWW is a cameo by G. Willow Wilson, the actual comics writer behind the 2014 series that this is all based on. And then it ends with this little jerk. She's a freaking action superhero. Mad skills. Yes, Hami Dizzle is the shoe thief whom Kamala saved in episode two. His caption, of course, is ice cream pizza for life because he loves it. We get this moment where Kamala nervously takes in her own reflection and strikes her comics pose. This book ending Kamala's awkward adjustments to her cosplay in front of the mirror back in episode one. Back then she was a pretender, now she is the real deal. Yusuf tells his daughter, And if you saved one life, well, you saved the world. Yes, this is a verse from the Quran. Whoever saves a life, it is as though he had saved the lives of all mankind. In this case, saving Kamran literally saved this realm from destruction. And if you remember back to the first Iron Man, Jensen and Tony Stark, time proved that by saving Tony Stark, he saved everything in reality. Yusuf reveals that they named her Kamala because Kamal means perfect in Arabic, while in Urdu, it is closer to wonder or marvel, making her their little Ms. Marvel. So if you think about it, her mother gave Kamala the suit that was made Made from gifts from Walid and Kareem, with a sigil from her necklace that had her own name in Urdu. Her grandmother provided the bangle, Bruno provided the mask, and now her father provides the name Ms. Marvel. And I just love this shot of Yusuf watching her go. Magic. Absolute magic. We see her leaping away, reflected in the lenses of his glasses. And Kamala sits on the lamplight, looking across the river at Manhattan, her red scarf in the breeze, recreated directly from the cover of Ms. Marvel number five. And I always just love how this image frames Kamala as a Jersey City hero, not rumbling with the bigger names in the city, but opting to protect her home neighborhood on this side of the river. One week later, Bruno shows up wearing a shirt reading either Gigawatt or Gigawatt, either way a nod to his past Marty McFly look, and he explains why the bangle in the Nor empowered Kamala, but not the others of her family, making the boldest declaration we have heard in the MCU in quite some time. Kamala, there's something different in your genes. Like, like a mutation. Whatever it is, it's just gonna be another label. <laughs> Holy shit! Yes, that was Ron Wasserman's 90s X-Men animated theme, which we also heard when Charles Xavier floated in in Multiverse of Madness. Yes, folks, Kamala Khan in the MCU is a mutant. This is the first 616 character defined as such in the MCU, and hearing the word mutation is such a huge deal. Now, making Kamala Khan a mutant is a retcon from the comics where Kamala is an Inhuman. Now, just a bit of background on the Inhumans. The Inhumans were really established in 1965. In the 80s, Marvel kind of backburnered them as the X-Men really became the dominant title of the brand until 1998, when a really great award-winning series by Paul Jenkins revitalized the Inhumans, and then in the 2000s, when Marvel Studios began producing films and TV, Marvel CEO Ike Perlmutter, overseeing a different division of Marvel, like the merch and the toys, separate from Kevin Feige, Perlmutter temporarily halted new X-Men comics from being written to instead focus on titles like Inhumans. Why? To give the company a way to produce mutant-esque movies and TV shows without having to go through Fox, because Fox owned the X-Men. So basically, Perlmutter was like, stop doing X-Men comics, we don't want to help out a rival studio. Which is a real bummer, because in previous decades, new Marvel heroes would get introduced and just 
be casually established as mutants. But Kamala Khan got her powers by breathing Terrigen Mist and entering a cocoon and coming out with stretchy powers categorized as an inhuman. So we could look at this as Kevin Feige just restoring Kamala Khan to what she probably would have been if not for Perlmutter's weird business decision. Then again, fans of the Inhumans and the ways the Inhumans were explored in the ABC series and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. might see this as Inhuman Erasure, and I totally hear them. But as much as I really love Inhuman characters like Black Bolt and Quake, I don't need Kamala Khan to be an Inhuman as well. And Black Bolt being in Multiverse of Madness means that Inhumans exist throughout the multiverse, including this one most likely, and Kamala being a mutant opens up other doors for the MCU. Remember, at Comic-Con in 2019, Kevin Feige did promise that mutants were coming, but he did not say X-Men necessarily, just mutants. And now we learn this is what he meant. Mutants, of course, include the X-Men, but also the Mutant Brotherhood, the Runaways, Deadpool. Namor is technically Marvel's first mutant, and we're gonna meet that guy in Black Panther Wakanda forever. And do not be surprised if they call him a mutant in that movie. And of course, Wanda Maximoff and her sons are also often considered mutants. Mutants all share the mutant gene, or the X gene. It occurs randomly throughout the population and can get triggered by puberty, trauma, or energy exposure, or some other kind of stimulus. In Kamala's case, it was the bangle. Kamala's bloodline came from the Nord dimension, but no one else in her family had powers, even with the bangle. Only Kamala, because of her unique mutant gene activated by the bangle that allows her to draw power from her ancestral dimension. Yes, it's a little confusing. Yes, it might have made more sense just to make her an inhuman, but oh well, now we get mutants. And along with Kamala, many more individuals will soon be established to have a mutant gene as well. Maybe some who have always been here just outside of our view. Like in 616, Magneto could have still had an origin in World War II, we just haven't seen it yet. Other mutants may arrive into 616 from another universe via an incursion, like how 838 had Patrick Stewart as Professor X, and Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool is confirmed to join the MCU. With Secret Wars on the horizon, any number of beloved X-Men actors could join the MCU as well. Look folks, we're going to be discussing the mutants a lot more in future videos. This was a seismic game changer, and I am stoked. Nakia says, Get in, Liz, we're getting Shawatama. Both a nod to the Avengers' favorite post-battle snack and the line from Mean Girls. <laughs> Get in, loser, we're going shopping. The closing credits merge imagery from Jersey City and Karachi, showing how both sides of Kamala's worlds are now united. Then on to the post credit scene, where Kamala's bangle glows a new color and her body twists into ribbon, and then she wakes up as Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers. Brie Larson making a cameo. While at first this reads like a nod to Kamala's initial transformation as she left the Terrigen cocoon into a doppelganger of her hero, Captain Marvel, in the comics, really what happened here was Kamala and Carol swapped places because she doesn't look at her own body in the mirror confused she just kind of looks around her surroundings confused where she is but notice how carol's suit is updated whereas before it was blue on top and red in the midsection and legs now it is red on top and blue everywhere else down to blue boots it actually looks more similar to her 90s look at the end of the captain marvel film she also does not wear the full red gauntlet length gloves her forearms are bare now with shorter wrist length fingerless gloves. Also notice Kamala's teleportation just looks different than you'd expect. Her body twists into ribbony putty. We haven't seen this kind of production design in the MCU. There's no glowing portal, thank God. It's a whole new design, meaning a completely new form of technology and magic is unfolding before our eyes. And in Marvel Comics, when characters like Nightcrawler teleport, they're actually traveling through the medium of another dimension in between those points. For Nightcrawler, it's the brimstone dimension. Here, I think it is teleportation through the negative zone, because I think the bangle is alien creature technology based on the Kree Nega Bands from Captain Marvel comics. In those comics, the Nega Bands were given to Captain Marvel by the Kree Supreme Intelligence and trapped him in the negative zone. Meanwhile on Earth, former Avenger Rick Jones uses these bands, clinks them together to trade places with Captain Marvel, just like these two women are swapping places. So I think Carol was in possession of the other bangle, the long lost one. Assuming these bangles are Kree tech and that the 10 rings are Kree tech, the pulsing beacon of the 10 rings could have been summoning the Kree empire to earth to acquire the second bangle. Meanwhile, Carol found one of these bangles and in this moment, spatially swapped places with Kamala. And the reason Carol says, oh no, 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 is that maybe she was in the negative zone in that moment. And now she knows she is now cosmically handcuffed to some poor girl who loves her, but now she doomed that girl to a frightening dimension. Setting all this up for the Marvel next summer. And since Kamala is now a mutant, who knows, maybe it makes it likelier that Rogue will appear in that movie and drain Carol's powers. But I use the word doomed, and that was no accident, my friends, because I think doom is going to play a very big part in all this. The Multiverse of Madness producers just confirmed that they designed Reed Richards' portal on the technology of Victor Von Doom's time platform. I think the MCU may be bracing to introduce doom. So there you have it, folks. Mutants, time travel, the negative zone, teleportation, the 10 rings, alternate dimensions, the DODC, 
magic Scott Lang's podcast? And then all of it wrapped together in a hug of wholesome family coming of age vibes with a killer soundtrack. I loved this show. Today, it is such an honor to be with Ms. Marvel, Kamala Khan herself, the first to be identified of a certain beloved category of Marvel superhero in the 616 MCU, or is it 616? We'll, we'll talk about that. We got Iman Vellani here with us today. Thank you so much for chatting with me, Iman. Welcome. Thank you. This I am so glad I got experienced the welcome back to new rock stars intro. That's <laughs> dream come true, man. Amazing. Well, this is a dream come true for us too. We're we're obviously a huge uh, fan of you here on this channel. This is actually the first time we've had an Avenger with us in the Blue Dungeon. Well, are you an Avenger? Can we call you an Avenger? Is that okay? Ooh, I I consider myself one. That's no fine. one's granted me the the access to calling myself that, but we'll see. Eventually, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, how how does someone get knighted in Avenger? We saw, you know, uh, Tom Holland get like the, yeah. the knighted thing and, you know, people like us are like, okay, so that is definitively how one becomes an Avenger then. <laughs> I know, there's some sort of initiation process. It's sure. it's all in Kevin Feige's mind now. Yeah, uh, and I, I just also ask because like, I, I don't know, I don't go on cruises, but people are like going on cruises, seeing videos of you with Anthony Mackie and they're asking me to break it down. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> we shot it like I, I got to London to film the Marvels last year and it was like the first thing we shot as soon as I got out of quarantine and everyone was so confused what we were filming. <laughs> it, they just like handed us the script and then put me on some green boxes and I was like jumping from one thing to another and like talking to Anthony Mackie's recording. Um, <laughs> it was weird. It was fun, but weird. Yeah. I think that's a testament to uh, to how well you are handling this. You know, Marvel actors are not given enough credit for the the guessing game that you all have when you're cast on these things. And the fact that you just look so calm and collected and confident in the way that you're playing Kamala and just look like you are in on the loop and part of the plan. And it seems like there's no confusion at all in the way you've been doing this. I, I feel like I've prepped my whole life for this. I think you are part of that reason now that I think about it. Just like the theory breakdowns, the trailer breakdowns, the poster breakdowns, all the breakdowns. I feel like the YouTube nerds are the the backbone of this fandom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's actually talk about your background a little bit because you know, obviously, you're the first of many things in the MCU. Again, congratulations on on how well you've been doing. It's just been a delight to Thank watch you. you on the show. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think part of the reason we love you here at New Rock Stars is the fact that you are a bit of an egghead, like we are. Like you know, I think you might be the first true MCU fanatic to actually get cast as a Marvel superhero. You know, a lot of actors claim that they're fans, but when you you know follow up with them and press them, they'll be like, well, my kids love the Spider-Mans and they told me it's cool. Uh, but is it true, you know, that you carry around a notebook filled with MCU facts? Do you have it on yeah. hand? I love it. This thing goes everywhere with me. <laughs> I think this is um, Kevin Feige's biggest fear, this notebook. <laughs> Don't let that out of your I sight. <laughs> no, I'm like terrified of like leaving it somewhere and then everyone's just like finding my deepest, darkest secrets. <laughs> no, but um, it's it's funny. So the first time I met Kevin was over Zoom, and I was just hyperventilating, and then go to production, and they're like, okay, Kevin's coming on Wednesday, and it's Monday, and he comes, and I just, like, stared at him until he left. I couldn't verbalize words or be a human at all, and so I had written this, like, four-page letter in case I wasn't able to talk again, and the first page was, like, me gushing over him. The next three were, like, 70 something questions I had about him and the MCU, like just how much hours of sleep he gets and like things about the fandom in general. And, and he like called me the next day and answered the first 40. And so the rest of the questions that he hasn't heard are in here. And That's every amazing. time I get the opportunity, it's just like, so why did you do this? <laughs> I mean, you are never allowed to get to the end of that list. I want you to just keep asking him questions because I'm think you're giving him ideas. You're giving him great ideas, I'm sure, for the future. I, I like to think so. <laughs> I love it. I have on standby my notebook that I bring into movie screenings. Like whenever I go. I was going to ask, <laughs> write, what is your writing. Like, process? Oh, and how I'm are you doing? Now. I <laughs> see. <laughs> Literally every time new projects are announced, I'm like, oh my God, all the work that these guys have to do, you know, wow. are you, are you doing okay? Are you getting sleep? That is so sweet of you to ask me that. Like I'm, uh, oh, that's so kind of you. I'm, <laughs> the combo just happened and I'm like, these guys, 
<laughs> no sleep for the God. No seriously. rest for the weary. I, you know, look, this is a, a labor of love here yeah. in New Rock Stars. And I'm so honored to be able to do what we do and to have this as a job. And like, I think the only downside is, you know, when I go watch movies, it, I do have to bring this notebook and I am scribbling the whole time. And like, I'm not allowed to like look, take my eyes off the screen. So I use my thumb to just like keep my place in a dark movie theater. And I like, I'm close to the end of the page. I'm writing on my pants now. So I have to flip. Uh, so it is work, but like, I don't know. It's, I can't complain about my job being to watch uh, hilarious, awesome uh, shows like Ms. Marvel and, no, and everything else. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, you if, just to make sure it's okay, you know, You've done a ton of interviews. Like, it's crazy, you know, for prepping for this interview, I'm like watching you on Jimmy Fallon or on The Daily Show. And I'm like, ah, well, I'm not Jimmy Fallon. I'm not Trevor Noah. But I am a, a YouTube nerd. And I feel like I want to get your permission. Is it okay if we just geek out about the MCU for the rest of this interview? Yes, please. This is, I was honestly most, I did Jimmy Fallon. I did all of those. But I was like most <laughs> nervous for this one. Because I have no idea what you're going to ask. And I, like, have so much respect for you and, like, this entire channel. It's a weird full oh, yeah. circle moment. But, yeah. Let's do let's, it. For this interview, you are now an honorary <laughs> New Rock Stars co-host. So, welcome, welcome. We we got someone on the inside of the MCU. So, welcome back to the dungeon. Uh, uh, yeah. I need a hello. Yeah. My name is oh, Lonnie T-shirt if, now. if it didn't smell so bad after a weekend of Comic-Con coverage, I would be wearing it now. <laughs> um but, um, okay, let's talk about Ms. Marvel. And spoiler warning for anyone who hasn't had the delightful opportunity to watch Ms. Marvel in that those six episodes. They are so much fun. Please go watch them uh, and enjoy them because this show has everything. Like, I had no idea how many corners of the MCU this show would touch on and, and what it means to be a nerd. And uh, we got to start with the big one. So in the finale episode, you were established as the first mutant that's identified in the MCU. And I assume you, you saw the Comic-Con announcements this past weekend. No mutants so far announced on the schedule, but we assume they're coming. I assume you can't talk too much uh, or really at all about where we might see mutants next. But I just want to ask you as a fan of all this, where do you want to see mutants show up next? Ooh. God, I don't even know. We didn't even know that scene was even going to make the cut. We shot it not knowing mm. if it was going to happen. Like, I got sent mm. that script before reshoots for our show started. And I was, like, freaking out, emailing everyone, texting everyone in all caps. I was like, this is happening. Please tell me I'm, like, a mutant. <laughs> um, and we we shot it. We were, like, still crossing our fingers, hoping it was going to make the cut. And it did. And, and it was literally all up to Kevin. It was... The, literally how this happened was Sun, our producer, was in one of the writer room meetings and she's like, what if we like, we, can, we can't figure this out. Like, what if we just made her a mutant or something? And Kim was like, okay. And that's it. <laughs> so I don't know what their plans are. I would love to see just like more, you know, mutants pop up and I, you know, Namor's coming. Just, just a lot mm -hmm. of people established as mutants. And then eventually we get some sort of X-Men team up together. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I think it seems to be the plan. You know, watching Multiverse of Madness, we were like, okay, well, they have Patrick Stewart coming in and maybe that's the way they're going to do it. But then uh, two minutes later, we're like, I guess not. Uh, but I like this approach of yeah. just establishing characters like you who are just who have that genetic predisposition. I think that's like a more organic way to go. And I'm I glad agree. that you get to be part of it. I know. What an honor. Um, I mean, like, yeah. Especially working with Sana and knowing, like, you know, they wanted to make her an, a, a mutant in the first place. And it was a weird time in comics, so it didn't yes. happen. But uh, it's it's so exciting. And, and everyone, I couldn't get any takes where I wasn't giggling except the one that we saw on Disney+. Plus. Literally every <laughs> single time Matt said the word, I, I had to break. It was just, like, too good to be true. Yeah. Iman, I loved the way you delivered it, too. Like, you did this thing that sometimes if you watch, like, outtakes from Saturday Night Live, some actors uh, will, to keep from breaking, will go. That's literally, you, yeah, but, that's the closest we can get to me not breaking. <laughs> it was <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. I'm so excited to see them, like, cut it all together, like, all my terrible outtakes of me just, like, laughing. I, I had to, oh, it was terrible. And Matt did such a good job in just saying the word, and I couldn't say the word in real life for the longest time until, like, recently. I kept calling it the M word. Mm -hmm. It was just... Ugh, give me chills. 
Yeah. Well, and the M word can mean anything in the MCU, right? Like we have Mephisto, we have House of M, you know, the M word has so many. I am so excited for the day that Mephisto actually comes into the MCU. Oh, me Greater too. Greater than your birthday. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll have to change my birthday to that date, you know, when he arrives. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so it's interesting to hear how that came about. I assume something like that had happened because it's interesting when you watch the episode, this scene almost feels like a post credit scene. It comes after we have this moment where Bruno- It was going to be, but yeah. we like, it, it just felt too good and we needed to, you know, like kind of keep people watching before. Sure. The actual post credit scene. So yeah, it totally was meant to be one. And it felt like this nice coda with uh, Bruno and Nakia. I love that Nakia gets the Mean Girls reference with the shawarma worked in. Yeah. It was like my favorite joke that episode. But do you have any uh, insight into what might have been in Bruno's note? Because we never saw what was on the note that he put in your locker. That's a great question. We did have, so that, that last lamppost shot that you saw, we did have a version where it's Kamala reading the note that that Bruno mm. left for her and they had written this this like fake note for me but they didn't show me what it was until I read it so I would get all emotional or whatever um mm. but I I think that's something we're gonna explore in, in season two if if that happens okay. I hope it happens I think okay. all these characters have a lot of story left to tell um uh -huh. but yeah I maybe it's Bruno's you know just pouring his soul out and then confessing his love for Kamala who knows yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so talking about that post credit scene, it you know, it's been confirmed that uh, Kamala and Carol Danvers by, by the producers uh, that they did swap places. We also learned that the director of the Marvels, Nia Costa, actually shot that scene, which which we speculated. It felt like it had a slightly different vibe to it. Did you know when you shot that scene where Kamala might be transported to? What did they tell you was happening in that moment? I'm and like, again, you okay. can plead the fifth. You don't have to say too much because I know it ties in with the next movie. So we, we did shoot that in the Marvels, not during Miss Marvel. So I do know the story because I was okay. in the movie. But um, yeah, they, they did switch places. Where okay. did she go? We'll find out in a year. Okay. I can't wait to find out. You know, we're looking for clues or just a sense of context. I like how Carol says, oh, no, 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 and runs away. And the way I read that is she's like worried where where this fan of her might now be. Um, like, can you at least give us a sense of what Kamala's initial emotional reaction when she arrives somewhere new? Or even you could just like make a face <laughs> into like what, how she might be feeling where she is now? Oh, God. A lot of fear and excitement at the same time of where she ends okay. up that's that's what i'll say uh, all right i will make 12 <laughs> theory videos about that answer <laughs> 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 I wanted to ask you, uh, oh, actually, let's do a little segment here called that I'm just going to call Debunk DeVos. This is where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I have, there's some questions about how exactly Kamala's powers come from her mutation, because obviously introducing her as a mutant seems like an answer to a question, but she has the Nor light, she has the bangle, she has the X gene. All three seem, seem to be necessary. And my explanation on this, and I, I kind of want you to debunk this, uh, but like, I'm thinking that the, the mutant gene might be the lock mechanism. Her family history with the Nord dimension might be on the other side of that lock door, the source of her power. Mm -hmm. And the bangle is the key that unlocks the lock to open the door. Is that yeah. the case, do you think, specific to Kamala Khan? Or do you think this could be uh, a way to describe all mutants in the MCU going forward? I, I feel like it's specific to Kamala. I think you're on the right track with it because we never really fleshed it out just because we didn't know if it was the scene was actually going to happen but i made many theory boards prior to filming because oh. i was so confused <laughs> um the way i justify it to myself is like yes the bangle unlocks her x gene i think her actual mutant power is the ability to facilitate the noor mm -hmm. so she is part jinn and she's part human but she can do what Comrade can't. Like, I don't think Comrade's a, hum a mutant because he can't harness the Nord the way that Kamala does. Mm. He can't, like, control it the way she does. And I, say, I think that's kind of her power. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm going with, that that her ability to kind of make shapes out of it is, is like, the mutant power. Like, like armor from the X-Men. Mm. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very similar vibe, and I think that's kind of what inspired, you know, the, the, the way we animated Kamala. Yeah. I like that. I like that there has to be some kind of, like, biological component a like a muscle memory that you're reconnecting with yeah. in order to be fully mutant i like that approach 
Um, mm-hmm. But she can use her powers without the bangle because a lot of people were like, oh, the bangle is what like lets her use her powers. I, I do think it's just something that unlocked it. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we'll get to see her without the bangle using her powers. Yeah, I like that too. I like the bangle is almost like a spark plug. It just kind of, it's what gets it all started, mm-hmm. but it's not a battery yeah. that's continuing, continuing to power it. Um, right. Actually, I wanted to ask about that moment. One of my favorite moments from the season is when Waleed explains the Nor dimension. We see this awesome holographic map display of the dimension's architecture. There's like a tree. And you know me, I'm like going frame by frame through that. I want to ask you, as someone who shot that scene, what did you see? Like, what, what was in the script? What? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Dude, it was like four LED lights in a circle. <laughs> And they're like, this thing's happening. And we're like, where do we look? They're just like in the middle, but not like down, but like kind of up, but not too high. Just like in the general middle. And there's like a map. And because a lot of this, the times we don't always have previses to like see what it looks like for, for scenes where it's like not fight scenes. Mm-hmm. And so it was just uh, using your imagination to be like, oh, yeah, this is what the Nord Dimension looks like. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's it's mostly just LED lights. Even Kamala's powers, the way we film it is like I'm standing on plexiglass mm-hmm. and we shine purple light underneath it. I love so, it. And yeah. and anytime I I hear answers like this, I'm it just blows my mind that you as actors are able to make this look so believable. Like you are reacting to it in the moment. It just feels like I don't know. Like I took some acting classes in college, but I don't think I could ever believably go on a green screen set and be like, this is actually something I'm holding or looking at. I honestly, it wasn't that hard. If you ask the right questions, especially with the powers, because this is such a new power set and something we haven't seen in the MCU yet. And so it's stressful because everything we establish now is going to be canon for the rest of the MCU. And so we had to be really careful about like, you know, my physicality and whatever, you know, how we manifest this, how difficult is it for Kamala to, you know, make these shapes? How, what does it look like? How, what does it feel like? Mm-hmm. And so just sitting down with their VFX people and asking all these questions, and then they come up with these pre-visualizations of what the scenes are going to look like. And so it gives you a, a bit of an idea because it's like a cartoon version of, of what it's going to look like for real. And yeah, but otherwise it's just really awkward and it's dead silent on stage and you're just like this pretending like you're saving people's lives. I mean, I think that's yeah. such a smart question to ask of how it feels, like how hard is it to do this? Because yeah, there are moments where it seems to burden or, or, or strain Kamala to uh, be making these shapes, uh, yeah. which is just interesting to watch for sure. I want to ask you about time travel. Uh, major twist in the series. Kamala goes back in time to the 40s during the partition to cast a trail of stars. And that is the historical trail of stars that saved her own grandmother. Um, and, you know, the, the yeah. time travel eggheads here call this like a causal loop or predestination. But did you have questions for how the logic of this time travel fits in with what we saw in Avengers Endgame or in Loki? Yep. First thing I asked, I'm like, doesn't this break all the rules? And they're like, <laughs> oh, we'll figure that out. Um, I I think the Marvels is going to explain it a little more, to be fair. God, I want to tell you things, but this is going to be on YouTube. It's Um, okay. It's fine. I understand. It's totally good. I don't want to get you in any trouble. I I, I do think, you know, God, no, I can't. I can't. In a year, please call me back. I absolutely we're going to talk more about this on the other side of it but I think one thing that we can at least infer from these uh, phase five and six announcements is that you know Kang is really the future of the MCU and I think one thing if you one interpretation of Loki could suggest that all of this was pre-scripted at least by he who remains or some other variant of Kang and I Mm -hmm. just wanted to ask like do you think it's possible and this is just nerd speculation. You know, if, if you can't speculate on it without you know, in bringing in what you already know, do you think Kang or He Remains might have planned specifically for Kamala to go back in time? Yeah. Okay, so the inscription on the bangle used to be what is destined for you will come for you. We did change it after that, mm. but I like to use that as a way of, you know, justifying how Kamala goes back in time and, and why that was meant to happen because there were so many questions. And we really wanted to bring partition in the story and, and just, I know it's, it's cramming a lot in, in episodes four and five, but you know, we didn't know if we were going to have season two and we had to put all our cards on the table and just like show everything about this culture and, 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 you know, the history of it. And so 
that line, what is destined for you will come for you, that used to be on the bangle is kind of a good sense of, you know, this was meant to happen, predestination, even if it kind of hurts the end game time travel rules, but so does old Steve Rogers. So exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, you know how it works. So yeah. <laughs> Kevin Feige is the king of this universe. That's how I like to. Yeah, I think so too. I think at some point we need an Easter egg where Kevin Feige can just be revealed as the one above all or one of the Kang variants or something like that. No. Um, he knows. Actually, you bring up, like, I loved learning about the, the history of the partition. I think it was referenced in some high school history class I took, but it's not something that's, that's talked enough about. I'm so glad yeah. that this show could go into that and, and humanize yeah. it and, in this beautiful way. And I I honestly, I have to confess, what you seek is seeking you was my favorite line of this of this mini series. And like once and I have to also say, I initially interpreted it as, oh, it's like a warning, like the person you're hunting down is gonna stab you in the back. So watch your back. And then the next episode, yeah. my heart melted when it was contextualized as what you just described, this sense of destiny that your deepest hopes and desires are just as eager to find their way to you. You know, this this line from Rumi, the Sufi poet and mystic. And I honestly, I'm writing my wedding vows right now. And I almost put that line in, but I thought it might be a little hokey. But I want to ask you, was there any line or scene in the series that was especially meaningful for you? Ooh, um, the first time in episode three, it, it's not even like that momentous of a scene. I mean, I guess it is. The first time Kamala uses her big in hand at the wedding after Bruno breaks his arm. So we we had like two takes to film that. And there, there was a version where we said him big in, but it didn't feel right in that moment. But it was it was the first time that we see her in big in properly. And I just, I wanted to get it right. And we had two takes to do it. And Sana, our producer, she's on set every day. And I just, I only care about her approval. And so like, we do the shot. And it was really like annoying technically because all the action scenes are just so exaggerated to look better on camera. And, you know, it, it's not how you naturally would punch just because, you know, we need to go this way and leave some space in the frame for the big fist. And so it was really hard. And, and I thought I did a really shitty job. And then I was like crying and, and Sano after just like came up to me and was really proud and, and it looked really good and it just felt really good and watching it felt really good. And so that like little moment, just all the little comic booky moments, I, I just appreciated a lot. Even even seeing Partition, it was one of the most stressful things to film just because it felt so real. And, and we were in Thailand in the middle of the night. It was like 40 degrees. It was terrible we had costume changes midday because we would sweat through our costumes and so wow. it, that entire scene was also like really emotional for a lot of people but yeah I honestly the entire show just had moments where either from the comics or from my culture I, I definitely re like embrace my culture a lot more now after filming the show which is crazy yeah, I think it's been like an enlightening experience for everyone watching this show, just to learn both about uh, like the culture of Karachi and then as well as like Jersey City and what it means to just spend an afternoon shopping with your mom. Like I thought yeah. it was so beautiful. All right, I got to ask you, I read the Reddit AMA where you said that after you said that the MCU wouldn't be 616 on the red carpet that I guess Kevin Feige saw you the next day and stared you down and just went like and walked away. <laughs> I uh, think about that every day. It's, I, I, it's okay. I get it. I get it. I get he makes decisions. That's fine. He's done a great job. I'm just yeah. trying to, you know, it's convenience. You Now you have to specify comics 616 versus MCU 616. And I'm just trying to save everyone's breath. You know, mm -hmm. like it's a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Kevin just doesn't like nine, 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 nine. So I get <laughs> and it. I don't blame him. There's too many nines to say. You don't, you lose track of your nines, three nines in. So I, I get it. <laughs> 616, I think, is a nice, clear slate, but it, it does require further explanation. You know, you have to like remind people, well, then the movies are an adaptation of the comics as opposed to a universe yeah. alongside them. Um, does which all is of how this, I used to think yeah. about it, which is why I disagreed yeah. with the 616. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Well, yeah. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> After going through this process, you're now in the midst of it. Does it give you a greater appreciation for how the execs build this universe? Or do you think it's still like something can be MCU canon if enough fans believe it to be true? Or are you still clinging to that? Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, well, I there are a lot of things that are planned so 
far ahead and, and you don't even realize until things just click and you're like, oh, this is a moment where you can bring back this from this movie. And it's just incredible how these guys like come up with this stuff and, and, you know, try to tie all the pieces together. And then there's a lot of seeds that we plant that we don't have plans for. And then like five years down the line, they'll be like, oh, remember that? Let's do that. It's like, I honestly like Iron Man too. And just like having the little Namor and then um, Wakanda references on the map. I feel like that was never planned, but I don't know. But now it's, you know, coming into play and it's awesome. Seeing how many Easter eggs that weren't even planted and you guys made just out of thin air. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Especially now being a part of this and then watching your breakdowns and be like, oh, we didn't even plan that, but did that works. Amazing. You can take credit for it. <laughs> you yeah. can absolutely take credit. And that's what's just so cool about what, growing up oh. with the MCU is seeing little like Atlantis references in the middle of the ocean on a map. And then now they can pay it off like 10 years later. It's just really exciting. And then I guess the last thing I want to ask you, yeah. we know that Peter Parker's on YouTube. I have a theory that he's just posting under an anonymous account, like the videos that he self records of himself. Is there a chance that Peter Parker and Kamala Khan mm -hmm. might've come across each other's content? Kamala's got her YouTube channel. I'm sure, I'm sure. I would love to see them like, talk about that and be like wait i subscribe <laughs> to yours too um yeah that that'd be fun i think they they had such fun vibes in the comics as well and those yeah. team ups were one of my favorites so hopefully we'll see it that. soon well we will leave it there but uh iman thank you so much it was such a delight to be able to meet you and to chat with you and i i can't wait to chat with you more after we see you next in the mcu yes i have so much to spill because like i want to tell you you're wrong about things That's but fair. i can't tell you what you're wrong about until Ugh, it hurts. until i'm anyway, proven wrong i'm thank right you for this this was fun i think that's the the trick you know <laughs> well thank you again iman i just want to say thank you and keep up the great work <laughs> thank you you too get some sleep okay back to present day boss with a 2023 update marvel studios has actually updated the statue of liberty since this series dropped to make it now bronze colored to better fit with the continuity of spider-man no way home and in the marvel's film the statue is bronze colored after reading mcu the reign of marvel studios the amazing 2023 book written by joanna robinson dave gonzalez and gavin edwards it's fascinating to learn that kamala khan was always intended to be a mutant in the comics and was only made an inhuman in the comics to appease the marvel ceo ike perlmutter who told the company to hold back on mutants and the Fantastic Four so characters wouldn't be as popular for the Fox movies who had the film rights at the time, and they were a rival studio at the time, but now Disney has reacquired all those rights. So by Marvel Studios retconning Kamala Khan as a mutant, baptized with Ron Wasserman's X-Men theme from the Fox series, that's just a very important indicator of Marvel's plans for Kamala going forward. And be sure to watch my early 2023 video diving deep into the actual history of 616 versus 199999, especially in the context of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse because both sides of that debate are misinformed and I explain why. Support New Rockstars with this flurkin shirt at nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. Follow me at EA Voss. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.